Hi, Alex. It's Martha Klein's here. James White gave me your number. I hope you don't mind me calling you. Of course not. How are you, Martha? Good, thanks. I'm ringing because I need a bit of advice. Oh yeah, what about? The training you did at JPNW a few years ago. I'm applying for the same thing. Oh right, yes, I did mine in 2014. Best thing I ever did. I'm still working there. Really? What are you doing? Well, now I work in the customer services department, but I did my initial training in finance. I stayed there for the first two years and then moved to where I am now. That's the same department I'm applying for. Did you enjoy it? Ah,、uh, I was pretty nervous to begin with. I didn't do well in my exams at school, and I was really worried because I failed maths. But it didn't actually matter because I did lots of courses on the job. Did you get a diploma at the end of your trainee period? I'm hoping to do the one in business skills. Yes, that sounds good. I took the one on IT skills, but I wish I'd done that one instead. Okay, that's good to know. Um. What about the other trainees? How did you get on with them? There were about twenty of us who started at the same time, and we were all around the same age. I was eighteen, and there was only one person younger than me who was seventeen. The rest were between eighteen and twenty. I made some good friends. I've heard lots of good things about the training at JPNW. It seems like there are a lot of opportunities there. Yeah, definitely. Because of its size, you can work in loads of different areas within the organisation. What about pay? I know you get a lower minimum wage than regular employees. That's right, which isn't great, but you get the same number of days holiday as everyone else, and the pay goes up massively if they offer you a job at the end of the training period. Yeah, but I'm not doing it for the money. It's the experience I think will be really useful. Everyone says by the end of the year you gain so much confidence. You're right. That's the most useful part about it. There's a lot of variety too. You're given lots of different things to do. I enjoyed it all. I didn't even mind the studying. Do you have to spend any time in college? Yes, one day each month. So you get lots of support from both your tutor and your manager.、Hmm, that's good. And the company is easy to get to, isn't it? Yes, it's very close to the train station, so the location's a real advantage. Have you got a date for your interview yet? Yes, it's on the twenty-third of this month. So long as you're well prepared, there's nothing to worry about. Everyone's very friendly. I am not sure what I should wear. What do you think? Nothing too casual, like jeans, for example. If you've got a nice jacket, wear that with a skirt or trousers. Okay, thanks. Any other tips? Um. Well, I know it's really obvious, but arrive in plenty of time. They hate people who are late, so make sure you know exactly where you have to get to. And one other useful piece of advice my manager told me before I had the interview for this job is to smile, even if you feel terrified. It makes people respond better to you. <laughs> I'll have to practice doing that in the mirror. <laughs> yeah. Well, good luck. Let me know if you need any more information. Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Snow Center. My name's Annie. I hope you enjoyed the bus trip from the airport. We've certainly got plenty of snow today. Well, you've come to New Zealand's premier snow and ski center. And we've a whole load of activities for you during your week here. Most visitors come here for the cross-country skiing, where you're on fairly flat ground for most of the time, rather than going down steep mountain sides. There are marked trails, but you can also leave these and go off on your own, and that's an experience not to be missed. You can go at your own speed. It's great aerobic exercise if you really push yourself. Or, if you prefer, you can just glide gently along and enjoy the beautiful scenery. This afternoon, you'll be going on a dog sled trip. You may have seen our dogs on TV recently racing in the Winter Sled Festival. If you want, you can have your own team for the afternoon and learn how to drive them, following behind our leader on the trail. Or, if you'd prefer, you can just sit back in the sled and enjoy the ride as a passenger. 
At the weekend, we have the Team Relay event, and you're all welcome to join in. We have a local school coming along, and a lot of the teachers are taking part too. Participation rather than winning is the main focus, and there's a medal for everyone who takes part. Participants are in teams of two to four, and each team must complete four laps of the course. For your final expedition, you'll head off to Mount Frenna, wearing a pair of special snowshoes which allow you to walk on top of the snow. This is an area where miners once searched for gold, though there are very few traces of their work left now. When the snow melts in summer, the mountain slopes are carpeted in flowers and plants. It's a long ascent, though not too steep, and walkers generally take a couple of days to get to the summit and return. You'll spend the night in our hut halfway up the mountain. That's included in your package for the stay. It's got cooking facilities, firewood, and water for drinking. For washing, we recommend you use melted snow, though, to conserve supplies. We can take your luggage up on our snowmobile for you for just ten dollars a person. The hut has cooking facilities, so you can make a hot meal in the evening and morning. But you need to take your own food. The weather on Mount Frenna can be very stormy. In that case, stay in the hut. Generally, the storms don't last long. Don't stress about getting back here to the centre in time to catch the airport bus. They'll probably not be running anyway. We do have an emergency locator beacon in the hut, but only use that if it's a real emergency, like if someone's ill or injured. Now, let me tell you something about the different ski trails you can follow during your stay here. Highland trails directly accessible from where we are now. This trail's been designed to give first timers an experience they'll enjoy, regardless of their age or skill. But it's also ideal for experts to practice their technique. Then there's Pine Trail. If you're nervous about skiing, leave this one to the experts. You follow a steep valley looking right down on the river below. Scary, but if you've fully mastered the techniques needed for hills, it's great fun. Stony Trail's a good choice once you've got a general idea of the basics. There are one or two tricky sections, but nothing too challenging. There's a shelter halfway where you can sit and take a break and enjoy the afternoon sunshine. And finally, Losers Trail. This starts off following a gentle river valley, but the last part is quite exposed, so the snow conditions can be challenging. If it's snowing or windy, check with us before you set out to make sure the trails open that day. Right. So now, if you'd like to follow me, we'll get started. I still got loads to do for our report on nutritional food labels. Me too. What did you learn from doing the project about your own shopping habits? Well, I've always had to check labels for traces of peanuts in everything I eat because of my allergy. But beyond that, I've never really been concerned enough to check how healthy a product is. This project has actually taught me to read the labels much more carefully. I tended to believe claims on packaging like low in fat. But I now realise that the healthy yogurt I've bought for years is full of sugar, and that it's actually quite high in calories.、Mm. Ready meals are the worst. Comparing the labels on supermarket pizzas was a real eye opener. Did you have any idea how many calories they contain? I was amazed. Yes, because unless you read the label really carefully. You wouldn't know that the nutritional values given are for half a pizza. When most people eat the whole pizza, not exactly transparent, is it? Not at all. But I expect it won't stop you from buying pizza. Probably not. No. I thought comparing the different labelling systems used by food manufacturers was interesting. I think the kind of labelling system used makes a big difference. Which one did you prefer? I like the traditional daily value system best, the one which tells you what proportion of your required daily intake of each ingredient the product contains. I'm not sure it's the easiest for people to use, but at least you get the full story. I like to know all the ingredients in a product, 
not just how much fat, salt and sugar they contain. But it's good supermarkets have been making an effort to provide reliable information for customers. Yes. There just needs to be more consistency between labelling systems used by different supermarkets in terms of portion sizes, etc. Hmm. The labels on the different brands of chicken flavour crisps were quite revealing too, weren't they? Yeah. I don't understand how they can get away with calling them chicken flavour when they only contain artificial additives. I know. I'd at least have expected them to contain a small percentage of real chicken. Absolutely. I think having nutritional food labelling has been a good idea, don't you? I think it will change people's behaviour and stop mothers, in particular, buying the wrong things. But didn't that study kind of prove the opposite? People didn't necessarily stop buying unhealthy products. They only said that might be the case. Those findings weren't that conclusive, and it was quite a small-scale study. I think more research has to be done. Yes, I think you're probably right. What do you think of the traffic light system? I think supermarkets like the idea of having a colour-coded system, red, orange or green, for levels of fat, sugar and salt in a product. But it's not been adopted universally, and not on all products. Why do you suppose that is? Pressure from the food manufacturers. Hardly surprising that some of them are opposed to flagging up how unhealthy their products are. I'd have thought it would have been compulsory. It seems ridiculous it isn't. I know. And what I couldn't get over is the fact that it was brought in without enough consultation. A lot of experts had deep reservations about it. That is a bit weird. I suppose there's an argument for doing the research now when consumers are familiar with this system. Yeah, maybe. The participants in the survey were quite positive about the traffic light system. Hmm. But I don't think they targeted the right people. They should have focused on people with low literacy levels because these labels are designed to be accessible to them. Yeah. But it's good to get feedback from all socio-economic groups and there wasn't much variation in their responses. No. But if they hadn't interviewed participants face-to-face, -face, they could have used a much bigger sample size. I wonder why they chose that method. Don't know. How were they selected? Did they volunteer or were they approached? I think they volunteered. The thing that wasn't stated was how often they bought packaged food. All we know is how frequently they use the supermarket. In my presentation, I'm going to talk about coffee and its importance both in economic and social terms. We think it was first drunk in the Arab world, but there's hardly any documentary evidence of it before the 1500s. Although, of course, that doesn't mean that people didn't know about it before then. However, there is evidence that coffee was originally gathered from bushes growing wild in Ethiopia, in the northeast of Africa. In the early 16th century, it was being bought by traders and gradually its use as a drink spread throughout the Middle East. It's also known that in 1522, in the Turkish city of Constantinople, which was the centre of the Ottoman Empire, the court physician approved its use as a medicine. By the mid-1500s, coffee bushes were being cultivated in the Yemen, and for the next hundred years, this region produced most of the coffee drunk in Africa and the Arab world. What's particularly interesting about coffee is its effect on social life. It was rarely drunk at home, but instead people went to coffee houses to drink it. These people, usually men, would meet to drink coffee and chat about issues of the day. But at the time... This chance to share ideas and opinions was seen as something that was potentially dangerous. And in 1623, the ruler of Constantinople demanded the destruction of all the coffee houses in the city. Although after his death, many new ones opened 
and coffee consumption continued. In the 17th century, coffee drinking spread to Europe, and here too, coffee shops became places where ordinary people, nearly always men, could meet to exchange ideas. Because of this, some people said that these places performed a similar function to universities. The opportunity they provided for people to meet together outside their own homes and to discuss the topics of the day had an enormous impact on social life, and many social movements and political developments had their origins in coffee house discussions. In the late 1600s, the Yemeni monopoly on coffee production broke down, and coffee production started to spread around the world, helped by European colonisation. Europeans set up coffee plantations in Indonesia and the Caribbean, and production of coffee in the colonies skyrocketed. Different types of coffee were produced in different areas, and it's interesting that the names given to these different types, like mocha or java coffee, were often taken from the port they were shipped to Europe from. But if you look at the labour system in the different colonies, there were some significant differences. In Brazil and the various Caribbean colonies, coffee was grown in huge plantations, and the workers there were almost all slaves. But this wasn't the same in all colonies. For example, in Java, which had been colonised by the Dutch, the peasants grew coffee and passed a proportion of this on to the Dutch, so it was used as a means of taxation. But whatever system was used, under the European powers of the 18th century, coffee production was very closely linked to colonisation. Coffee was grown in ever-increasing quantities to satisfy the growing demand from Europe, and it became nearly as important as sugar production, which was grown under very similar conditions. However, coffee prices were not yet low enough for people to drink it regularly at home, so most coffee consumptions still took place in public coffee houses, and it still remained something of a luxury item. In Britain, however, a new drink was introduced from China and started to become popular, gradually taking over from coffee, although at first it was so expensive that only the upper classes could afford it. This was tea, and by the late 1700s it was being widely drunk. However, when the USA gained independence from Britain in 1776, they identified this drink with Britain, and coffee remained the preferred drink in the USA, as it still is today. So, by the early 19th century, coffee was already being widely produced and consumed. But during this century, production boomed, and coffee prices started to fall. This was partly because new types of transportation had been developed, which were cheaper and more efficient. So now, working people could afford to buy coffee. It wasn't just a drink for the middle classes. And this was at a time when large parts of Europe were starting to work in industries. And sometimes this meant their work didn't stop when it got dark. They might have to continue throughout the night. So the use of coffee as a stimulant became important. It wasn't just a drink people drank in the morning for breakfast. There were also changes in cultivation. What I'm... Good morning. Uh, what can I do for you? I want to report a theft. I had some things stolen out of my bag yesterday. I'm sorry to hear that. Right, so I'll need to take a few details. Can I start with your name? Louise Taylor. Okay, thank you. And are you resident in the UK? No, I'm actually Canadian, though my mother was British. And your date of birth? December 14th, 1977. So you're just visiting this country? That's right. I come over most summers on business. I'm an interior designer, and I come over to buy old furniture, antiques, you know? There are some really lovely things around here. But you need to get out to the small towns. I've had a really good trip this year, until this happened. Okay. So you've been here quite a while? Yes. 
I'm here for two months. I go back next week. So, may I ask where you're staying now? Well, at present, I've got a place at Park Apartments. That's on King Street. I was staying at the Riverside Apartments on the same street, but the apartment there was only available for six weeks, so I had to find another one. Okay. And the apartment number? Fifteen. Right. Now, I need to take some details of the theft. So, you said you had some things stolen out of your bag? That's right. And were you actually carrying the bag when the theft took place? Yes. I really can't understand it. I had my backpack on, and I went into a supermarket to buy a few things, and when I opened it up, my wallet wasn't there. And what did your wallet have in it? Well, fortunately, I don't keep my credit cards in that wallet. I keep them with my passport in an inside compartment in my backpack, but there was quite a bit of cash there, about 250 pounds sterling, I should think. I withdrew 300 pounds from my account yesterday, but I did a bit of shopping, so I must have already spent about 50 pounds of that. Okay. At first I thought, oh, I must have left the wallet back in the apartment. But then I realized my phone had gone as well. It was only a week old, and that's when I realized I'd been robbed. Anyway, at least they didn't take the keys to my rental car. Yes. So you say the theft occurred yesterday? Yes. So that was September the 10th? And do you have any idea at all of where or when the things might possibly have been stolen? Well... At first, I couldn't believe it because the bag had been on my back ever since I left the apartment after lunch. It's just a small backpack, but I generally use it when I'm traveling because it seems safer than a handbag. Anyway, I met up with a friend, and we spent a couple of hours in the museum. But I do remember that as we were leaving there, at about four o'clock, a group of young boys ran up to us. And they were really crowding round us, and they were asking us what time it was. Then, all of a sudden, they ran off. Can you remember anything about them? The one who did most of the talking was wearing a T-shirt with a picture of something. Ah, uh, let's see. A tiger. Right. Any idea of how old he might have been? Around twelve years old. And can you remember anything else about his appearance? Not much. He was quite thin. Color of hair? I do remember that. He was blonde. All the others were dark-haired. And any details of the others? Not really. They came and went so quickly. Right. So, what I'm going to do now is give you a crime reference number so you can contact your insurance company. So, this is ten digits. 87954-82361. Thank you. So, should I contact the... Good morning, everyone. My name's Janet Parker, and I'm the Human Resources Manager. We're very happy to welcome you to your new apprenticeship. I hope that the next six months will be a positive and enjoyable experience for you. I'd like to start with some general advice about being an apprentice. Most of you have very little or no experience of working for a big organisation, and the first week or so may be quite challenging. There will be a lot of new information to take in, but don't worry too much about trying to remember everything. The important thing is to check with someone if you're not sure what to do. You'll find your supervisor is very approachable and won't mind explaining things or helping you out. You're here to learn. So make the most of that opportunity. You'll be spending time in different departments during your first week, so make an effort to talk to as many people as possible about their work. You'll make some new friends and find out lots of useful information.
As well as having a supervisor, you'll each be assigned a mentor. This person will be someone who's recently completed an apprenticeship, and you'll meet with them on a weekly basis. Their role is to provide help and support throughout your apprenticeship. Of course, this doesn't mean they'll actually do any of your work for you. Instead, they'll be asking you about what goals you've achieved so far, as well as helping you to identify any areas for improvement. You can also discuss your more long-term ambitions with them as well. Now, I just want to run through a few company policies for our apprenticeship scheme with you. Most importantly, the internet. As part of your job, you'll be doing some research online, so obviously you'll have unlimited access for that. But please don't use it for personal use. You'll have your own phones for that. Some of you have already asked me about flexible working. After your probationary three-month period, some of you will be eligible for this, but it will depend on which department you're in and what your personal circumstances are. So please don't assume you'll automatically be permitted to do this. I want to make sure there's no confusion about our holiday policy. Apart from any statutory public holidays, we ask that you don't book any holidays until after your six-month apprenticeship has finished. Time off should only be taken if you are unwell. Please speak to your supervisor if this is going to be a problem. You'll be expected to work a forty-hour week, but there may be opportunities to do overtime during busy periods. Although you're not required to do this, it can be a valuable experience. So we advise you to take it up if possible. Obviously, we understand that people do have commitments outside work, so don't worry if there are times when you are unavailable. As you know, we don't have a formal dress code here. You may wear casual clothes as long as they're practical. And the only restriction for shoes we have is on high heels for health and safety reasons. Comfortable shoes like trainers are preferable. There's a heavily subsidised canteen on site where you can get hot meals or salads cheaply. Snacks and drinks are also provided, so we've decided to introduce a no-packed lunch policy. This is partly to encourage healthy eating at work. And partly to stop people from eating at their workstation, which is unhygienic. Okay, moving on to. Okay, so what I'd like you to do now is to talk to your partner about your presentations on urban planning. You should have done most of the reading now, so I'd like you to share your ideas and talk about the structure of your presentation and what you need to do next. Okay, Rob. I'm glad we chose quite a specific topic: cities built next to the sea. It made it much easier to find relevant information. Yeah, and cities are growing so quickly. I mean, we know that more than half the world's population lives in cities now. Yeah, though that's all cities, not just ones on the coast. But most of the biggest cities are actually built by the sea. I'd not realised that before. Nor me. And what's more, a lot of them are built at places where rivers come out into the sea. But apparently, this can be a problem. Why? Well, as the city expands, agriculture and industry tend to spread further inland along the rivers, and so agriculture moves even further inland up the river. That's not necessarily a problem, except it means more and more pollutants are discharged into the rivers. So these are brought downstream to the cities. Right. Did you read that article about Miami on the east coast of the USA? No. Well, apparently, back in the 1950s, they built channels to drain away the water in case of flooding. Sounds sensible. Yeah, they spent quite a lot of money on them, but what they didn't take into account was global warming. So they built the drainage channels too close to sea level, and now sea levels are rising. They're more or less useless. If there's a lot of rain, the water can't run away. There's nowhere for it to go. 
The whole design was faulty. So, what are the authorities doing about it now? I don't know. I did read that they're aiming to stop disposing of wastewater into the ocean over the next ten years. But that won't help with flood prevention now, will it? No, really. They just need to find the money for something to replace the drainage channels in order to protect against flooding now. But in the long term, they need to consider the whole ecosystem. Right. Really, though, coastal cities can't deal with their problems on their own, can they? I mean, they've got to start acting together at an international level instead of just doing their own thing. Absolutely. The thing is, everyone knows what the problems are, and environmentalists have a pretty good idea of what we should be doing about them. So they should be able to work together to some extent. But it's going to be a long time before countries come to a decision on what principles they're prepared to abide by. Yeah, if they ever do. So I think we've probably got enough for our presentation. It's only fifteen minutes. Okay. So I suppose we'll begin with some general historical background about why coastal cities were established. But we don't want to spend too long on that. The other students will already know a bit about it. It's all to do with communications and so on. Yes, we should mention some geographical factors,、uh, things like wetlands and river estuaries and coastal erosion and so on. We could have some maps of different cities with these features marked. On a handout, you mean, or some slides everyone can see? Yeah, that'd be better. It'd be good to go into past mistakes in a bit more detail. Did you read that case study of the problems there were in New Orleans with flooding a few years ago? Yes, we could use that as the basis for that part of the talk. I don't think the other students will have read it, but they'll remember hearing about the flooding at the time. Hmm. Okay. So that's probably enough background. So then we'll go on to talk about what actions been taken to deal with the problems of coastal cities. Okay. What else do we need to talk about? Maybe something on future risks, looking more at the long term if populations continue to grow. Yeah, we'll need to do a bit of work there. I haven't got much information, have you? No, we'll need to look at some websites. Shouldn't take too long. Okay, and I think we should end by talking about international implications. Maybe we could ask people in the audience. We've got people from quite a lot of different places. That'd be interesting if we have time. Yes. So now, should we go? On? Producing enough energy to meet our needs has become a serious problem. Demand is rising rapidly because of the world's increasing population and expanding industry. Burning fossil fuels like gas, coal, and oil seriously damages the environment, and they'll eventually run out. For a number of years now, scientists have been working out how we can derive energy from renewable sources, such as the sun and wind, without causing pollution. Today, I'll outline marine renewable energy, also called ocean energy. Which harnesses the movement of the oceans. Marine renewable energy can be divided into three main categories: wave energy, tidal energy, and ocean thermal energy conversion. And I'll say a few words about each one. First, wave energy. Numerous devices have been invented to harvest wave energy. With names such as Wave Dragon, the Penguin, and Mighty Whale, and research is going on to try and come up with a really efficient method. This form of energy has plenty of potential, as the source is constant, and there's no danger of waves coming to a standstill. Electricity can be generated using onshore systems, using a reservoir. Or offshore systems, but the problem with ocean waves is that they're erratic, with the wind making them travel in every direction. This adds to the difficulty of creating efficient technology. Ideally, all the waves would travel smoothly and regularly along the same straight line. Another drawback 
is that sand and other sediment on the ocean floor might be stopped from flowing normally, which can lead to environmental problems. The second category of marine energy that I'll mention is tidal energy. One major advantage of using the tide, rather than waves, as a source of energy, is that it's predictable. We know the exact times of high and low tides for years to come. For tidal energy to be effective, the difference between high and low tides needs to be at least five meters. And this occurs naturally in only about 40 places on Earth. But the right conditions can be created by constructing a tidal lagoon, an area of seawater separated from the sea. One current plan is to create a tidal lagoon on the coast of Wales. This will be an area of water within a bay at Swansea, sheltered by a U-shaped breakwater, or dam, built out from the coast. The breakwater will contain 16 hydro turbines, and as the tide rises, water rushes through the breakwater, activating the turbines, which turn a generator to produce electricity. Then, for three hours as the tide goes out, the water is held back within the breakwater, increasing the difference in water level until it's several meters higher within the lagoon than in the open sea. Then, in order to release the stored water, gates in the breakwater are opened. It pours powerfully out of the lagoon, driving the turbines in the breakwater in the opposite direction, and again generating thousands of megawatts of electricity. As there are two high tides a day, this lagoon scheme would generate electricity four times a day, every day, for a total of around 14 hours in every 24, and enough electricity for over 150,000 homes. This system has quite a lot in its favor. Unlike solar and wind energy, it doesn't depend on the weather. The turbines are operated without the need for fuel, so it doesn't create any greenhouse gas emissions, and very little maintenance is needed. It's estimated that electricity generated in this way will be relatively cheap, and that manufacturing the components would create more than 2,000 jobs, a big boost to the local economy. On the other hand, there are fears that lagoons might harm both fish and birds, for example by disturbing migration patterns and causing a build-up of silt affecting local ecosystems. There are other forms of tidal energy, but I'll go on to the third category of marine energy, ocean thermal energy conversion. This depends on there being a big difference in temperature between surface water and the water a couple of kilometers below the surface, and this occurs in tropical coastal areas. The idea is to bring cold water up to the surface using a submerged pipe. The concept dates back to 1881. When... Hi, come and take a seat. Thank you. My name's Carl Rogers and I'm one of the doctors here at the Total Health Clinic. So I understand this is your first visit to the clinic? Yes, it is. Okay. Well, I hope you'll be very happy with the service you receive here. So if it's all right with you, I'll take a few details to help me give you the best possible service. Sure. So can I check, first of all, that we have the correct personal details for you? So your full name is Julie Ann Garcia. That's correct. Perfect. And can I have a contact phone number? It's 219-442-9785. Okay, and then can I just check that we have the correct date of birth? October 10th, 1992. Oh, I actually have 1991. I'll just correct that now. Right, so that's all good. Now I just need a few more personal details. Do you have an occupation, either full-time or part-time? Uh, yes, I work full-time in Esterhazy's. You know the restaurant chain? 
I started off as a waitress there a few years ago, and I'm a manager now. Oh, I know them. Yeah, they're down on 114th Street, aren't they? Uh, that's right. Yeah, I've been there a few times. I just love their salads. <laughs> that's good to hear. Right. So one more thing I need to know before we talk about why you're here, Julie, and that's the name of your insurance company. It's Cawley Life Insurance. That's C A W L E Y. Excellent. Thank you so much. Now, Julie, let's look at how we can help you. So, tell me a little about what brought you here today. Well, I've been getting a pain in my knee, the left one. Not very serious at first, but it's gotten worse. So, I thought I ought to see someone about it. That's certainly the right decision. So, how long have you been aware of this pain? Is it just a few days, or is it longer than that? Longer. It's been worse for the last couple of days, but it's three weeks since I first noticed it. It came on quite gradually, though, so I kind of ignored it at first. And have you taken any medication yourself, or treated it in any way? Um, yeah, I've been taking medication to deal with the pain, Tylenol, and that works okay for a few hours, but I don't like to keep taking it. Okay. And what about heat treatment? Have you tried applying heat at all? No, but I have been using ice on it for the last few days. And does that seem to help the pain at all? A little, yes. Good. Now you look as if you're quite fit normally. I am, yes. So do you do any sport on a regular basis? Yes, I play a lot of tennis. I belong to a club, so I go there a lot. I'm quite competitive, so I enjoy that side of it as well as the exercise. But I haven't gone since this started. Sure. And do you do any other types of exercise?、Uh, yeah, I sometimes do a little swimming, but usually just when I'm on vacation. But normally I go running a few times a week. Maybe three or four times. Hmm. So your legs are getting quite a pounding, but you haven't had any problems up to now. No, not with my legs. I did have an accident last year when I slipped and hurt my shoulder, but that's better now. Excellent. And do you have any allergies? No, none that I'm aware of. And do you take any medication on a regular basis? Well, I take vitamins, but that's all. I'm generally very healthy. Okay. Well, let's have a closer look and see what might be causing this problem. If you can just get up, we'll be arriving at Branley Castle in about five minutes. But before we get there, I'll give you a little information about the castle and what our visit will include. So, in fact, there's been a castle on this site for over eleven hundred years. The first building was a fort constructed in nine fourteen A.D. for defence against Danish invaders. By King Alfred the Great's daughter, who ruled England at the time. In the following century, after the Normans conquered England, the land was given to a nobleman called Richard de Vere, and he built a castle there that stayed in the de Vere family for over four hundred years. However, when Queen Elizabeth I announced that she was going to visit the castle in 1576, it was beginning to look a bit run down. And it was decided that rather than repair the guest rooms, they'd make a new house for her out of wood next to the main hall. She stayed there for four nights, and apparently it was very luxurious. But unfortunately, it was destroyed a few years later by fire. In the 17th century, the castle belonged to the wealthy Fenis family, who enlarged it and made it more comfortable. However, by 1982, the Fenis family could no longer afford to maintain the castle, even though they received government support, and they put it on the market. It was eventually taken over by a company who owned a number of amusement parks. But when we get there, I think you'll see that they've managed to retain the original atmosphere of the castle. When you go inside, you'll find that in the staterooms. There are lifelike moving wax models dressed in costumes of different periods in the past, which even carry on conversations together. As well as that, in every room there are booklets giving information about what the room was used for and the history of the objects and furniture it contains. The castle park's quite extensive. At one time, sheep were kept there. And in the 19th century, the owners had a little zoo with animals like rabbits and even a baby elephant. Nowadays, the old zoo buildings are used for public displays of paintings and sculpture. 
The park also has some beautiful trees, though the oldest of all, which dated back 800 years, was sadly blown down in 1987. Now you're free to wander around on your own until 4.30, but then, at the end of our visit, we'll all meet together at the bottom of the Great Staircase. We'll then go on to the Long Gallery, where there's a wonderful collection of photographs showing the family who owned the castle a hundred years ago having tea and cakes in the conservatory. And we'll then take you to the same place where afternoon tea will be served to you. Now, if you can take a look at your plans, you'll see Branley Castle has four towers joined together by a high wall, with the river on two sides. Don't miss seeing the Great Hall. That's near the river in the main tower, the biggest one which was extended and redesigned in the 18th century. If you want to get a good view of the whole castle, you can walk around the walls. The starting point's quite near the main entrance. Walk straight down the path until you get to the south gate, and it's just there. Don't go on to the north gate. There's no way up from there. There'll shortly be a show in which you can see archers displaying their skill with a bow and arrow. The quickest way to get there is to take the first left after the main entrance and follow the path past the bridge. Then you'll see it in front of you at the end. If you like animals, there's also a display of hunting birds, falcons and eagles and so on. If you go from the main entrance in the direction of the south gate, but turn right before you get there instead of going through it, you'll see it on your right, past the first tower. At 3 p.m., there's a short performance of traditional dancing on the outdoor stage. That's right at the other side of the castle from the entrance and over the bridge. It's about ten minutes' walk or so. And finally, the shop. It's actually inside one of the towers, but the way in is from the outside. Just take the first left after the main entrance, go down the path, and take the first right. It's got some lovely gifts and souvenirs. Right, so we're just arriving. So, Rosie and Martin, let's look at what you've got for your presentation on woolly mammoths. OK, we've got a short outline here. Thanks. Uh, so, it's about a research project in North America. Yes, but we thought we needed something general about woolly mammoths in our introduction to establish that they were related to our modern elephant and they lived thousands of years ago in the last ice age. Maybe we could show a video clip of a cartoon about mammoths, but that'd be a bit childish. Or we could have a diagram. It could be a timeline to show when they lived, with illustrations. Or we could just show a drawing of them walking in the ice. No, let's go with your last suggestion. Good. Then you're describing the discovery of the mammoth tooth on St. Paul's Island in Alaska and why it was significant. Yes. The tooth was found by a man called Russell Graham. He picked it up from under a rock in a cave. He knew it was special. For a start, it was in really good condition, as if it had been just extracted from the animal's jawbone. Anyway... They found it was 6,500 years old. So why was that significant? Well, the mammoth bones previously found on the North American mainland were much less recent than that, so this was really amazing. Then we're making an animated diagram to show the geography of the area in prehistoric times. So originally, St Paul's Island wasn't an island. It was connected to the mainland, and mammoths and other animals, like bears, were able to roam around the whole area. Then the climate warmed up, and the sea level began to rise, and the island got cut off from the mainland. So those mammoths on the island couldn't escape. They had to stay on the island. And in fact, the species survived there for thousands of years after they'd become extinct on the mainland. 
So why do you think they died out on the mainland? No one's sure. Anyway, next we'll explain how Graham and his team identified the date when the mammoths became extinct on the island. They concluded that the extinction happened five thousand six hundred years ago, which is a very precise time for a prehistoric extinction. It's based on samples they took from mud at the bottom of a lake on the island. They analysed it to find out what had fallen in over time. Bits of plants, volcanic ash, and even DNA from the mammoths themselves. It's standard procedure, but it took nearly two years to do. So why don't you quickly go through the main sections of your presentation and discuss what actions needed for each part? Okay. So for the introduction, we're using a visual. So once we've prepared that, we're done. I'm not sure. I think we need to write down all the ideas we want to include here, not just rely on memory. How we begin the presentation is so important.、Mm, you're right. The discovery of the mammoth tooth is probably the most dramatic part, but we don't have that much information. Only what we got from the online article. I thought maybe we could get in touch with the researcher who led the team. And ask him to tell us a bit more. Great idea. What about the section with the initial questions asked by the researchers? We've got a lot on that, but we need to make it interesting. We could ask the audience to suggest some questions about it, and then see how many of them we can answer. I don't think it would take too long. Yes, that would add a bit of variety. Then the section on further research carried out on the island. Analyzing the mud in the lake. I wonder if we've actually got too much information here. Should we cut some? I don't think so. But it's all a bit muddled at present. Yes. Maybe it would be better if it followed a chronological pattern. I think so. The findings and possible explanations section is just about ready. But we need to practice it so we're sure it won't overrun. I think it should be okay. But yes, let's make sure.、Hmm. In the last section, relevance to the present day, you've got some good ideas. But this is where you need to move away from the ideas of others and give your own viewpoint. Okay, we'll think about that. Now, shall we show you some of the? In this series of lectures about the history of weather forecasting. I'll start by examining its early history. That'll be the subject of today's talk. Okay, so we'll start by going back thousands of years. Most ancient cultures had weather gods, and weather catastrophes such as floods played an important role in many creation myths. Generally. Weather was attributed to the whims of the gods, as the wide range of weather gods in various cultures shows. For instance, there's the Egyptian sun god Ra and Thor, the Norse god of thunder and lightning. Many ancient civilizations developed rites such as dances in order to make the weather gods look kindly on them. But The weather was of daily importance. Observing the skies and drawing the correct conclusions from these observations was really important. In fact, their survival depended on it. It isn't known when people first started to observe the skies, but at around 650 BC, the Babylonians produced the first short-range weather forecasts. Based on their observations of clouds and other phenomena, the Chinese also recognized weather patterns, and by 300 BC, astronomers had developed a calendar which divided the year into 24 festivals, each associated with a different weather phenomenon. The ancient Greeks were the first to develop a more scientific approach to explaining the weather. 
The work of the philosopher and scientist Aristotle in the fourth century BC is especially noteworthy, as his ideas held sway for nearly two thousand years. In three hundred and forty BC, he wrote a book in which he attempted to account for the formation of rain, clouds, wind, and storms. He also described celestial phenomena such as halos, that is, bright circles of light around the sun, the moon, and bright stars, and comets. Many of his observations were surprisingly accurate. For example, he believed that heat could cause water to evaporate, but he also jumped to quite a few wrong conclusions. Such as that winds are breathed out by the earth. Errors like this were rectified from the Renaissance onwards. For nearly two thousand years, Aristotle's work was accepted as the chief authority on weather theory. Alongside this, though, in the Middle Ages, weather observations were passed on in the form of proverbs. Such as red sky at night, shepherd's delight; red sky in the morning, shepherd's warning. Many of these are based on very good observations and are accurate, as contemporary meteorologists have discovered. For centuries, any attempt to forecast the weather could only be based on personal observations, but in the 15th century. Scientists began to see the need for instruments. Until then, the only ones available were weather vanes to determine the wind direction, and early versions of rain gauges. One of the first invented in the 15th century was a hygrometer, which measured humidity. This was one of many inventions that contributed to the development of weather forecasting. In 1592, the Italian scientist and inventor Galileo developed the world's first thermometer. His student Torricelli later invented the barometer, which allowed people to measure atmospheric pressure. In 1648, the French philosopher Pascal proved that pressure decreases with altitude. This discovery was verified by English astronomer Halley in 1686, and Halley was also the first person to map trade winds. This increasing ability to measure factors related to weather helped scientists to understand the atmosphere and its processes better, and they started collecting weather observation data systematically. In the 18th century. The scientist and politician Benjamin Franklin carried out work on electricity and lightning in particular, but he was also very interested in weather and studied it throughout most of his life. It was Franklin who discovered that storms generally travel from west to east. In addition to new meteorological instruments, other developments contributed to our understanding of the atmosphere. People in different locations began to keep records, and in the mid 19th century, the invention of the telegraph made it possible for these records to be collated. This led, by the end of the 19th century, to the first weather services. It was not until the early 20th century that mathematics and physics became part of meteorology, and. We'll continue from that point next week. Hello, Flanders Conference Hotel. Oh, hi. I wanted to ask about conference facilities at the hotel. Have I come through to the right person? Mhm.、Mm、you have. I'm the customer services manager. My name's Angela. So, how can I help you? Well, I'm calling from Barrett and Stanson's. We're a medical company based in Perth. Oh yes. And we're organising a conference for our clients to be held in Sydney. It'll be held over two days, and we're expecting about fifty or sixty people. 
When were you thinking of having it? Sometime early next year, like the end of January. It'd have to be a weekend. Ah,、uh, let me see. Our conference facilities are already booked for the weekend beginning January the twenty eighth. We could do the first weekend in February. How about January the twenty first? Ah, oh, I'm afraid that's booked too. Well, let's go for the February date then. So that's the weekend beginning the fourth. Okay. Now, can you tell me a bit about what conference facilities you have? Sure. So, for talks and presentations, we have the Tesla room. Sorry. Tesla. That's spelled T E S L A. It holds up to a hundred people, and it's fully equipped with a projector and so on. How about a microphone? Yes, that'll be all set up ready for you. And there'll be one that members of the audience can use too for questions if necessary. Fine. And we'll also need some sort of open area where people can sit and have a cup of coffee. And we'd like to have an exhibition of our products and services there as well. So that'll need to be quite a big space. Mm-hmm. That's fine. There's a central atrium with all those facilities. And you can come before the conference starts if you want to set everything up. Great. And I presume there's Wi-Fi. Oh yes, that's free and available throughout the hotel. Okay. Would you also like us to provide a buffet lunch? We can do a two-course meal with a number of different options. What sort of price are we looking at for that? Well, I can send you a copy of the standard menu. That's forty-five dollars per person, or you can have the special for twenty-five dollars more. I think the standard should be okay, but yes, send me the menu. Now we're also going to need accommodation on the Saturday night for some of the participants. I'm not sure how many, but probably about twenty-five. So, what do you charge for a room? Well, for conference attendees, we have a twenty-five percent reduction, so we can offer you rooms at a hundred and thirty-five dollars. Normally, a standard room's a hundred and eighty dollars. And does that include breakfast? Sure, and of course, guests can also make use of all the other facilities at the hotel. So we've got a spa where you can get massages and facials and so on. And there's a pool up on the roof for the use of guests. Oh, great! Now, what about transport links? The hotel's downtown, isn't it? Yes, it's about twelve kilometres from the airport. But there's a complimentary shuttle bus for guests, and it's only about ten minutes walk from the central railway station. Okay. Now I don't know Sydney very well. Can you just give me an idea of the location of the hotel? Ah、uh, well, it's downtown on Wilby Street. Ah,、uh, that's quite a small street, and it's not very far from the sea. And of course, if the conference attendees want to go out on their Saturday evening, there's a huge choice of places to eat. Then, if they want to make a night of it, they can go on to one of the clubs in the area. There are a great many to choose from. Okay. So, if we go ahead with this, can you give me some information about how much we're looking at? Hello, Flanders Conference Hotel. Oh, hi. I wanted to ask about conference facilities at the hotel. Have I come through to the right person? Mhm. You have. I'm the customer services manager. My name's Angela. So, how can I help you? Well, I'm calling from Barrett and Stansons. We're a medical company based in Perth. Oh yes. And we're organising a conference for our clients to be held in Sydney. It'll be held over two days, and we're expecting about fifty or sixty people. When were you thinking of having it? Sometime early next year, like the end of January. It'd have to be a weekend. Ah,、uh, let me see. Our conference facilities are already booked for the weekend beginning January the twenty eighth. We could do the first weekend in February.
How about January the twenty-first? Ah,、uh, oh, I'm afraid that's booked too. Well, let's go for the February date then. So that's the weekend beginning the fourth. Okay. Now, can you tell me a bit about what conference facilities you have? Sure. So, for talks and presentations, we have the Tesla room. Sorry. Tesla. That's spelled T E S L A. It holds up to a hundred people, and it's fully equipped with a projector and so on. How about a microphone? Yes, that'll be all set up ready for you, and there'll be one that members of the audience can use too for questions if necessary. Fine, and we'll also need some sort of open area where people can sit and have a cup of coffee. And we'd like to have an exhibition of our products and services there as well, so that'll need to be quite a big space. Mhm, that's fine. There's a central atrium with all those facilities, and you can come before the conference starts if you want to set everything up. Great. And I presume there's Wi-Fi. <laughs> oh yes, that's free and available throughout the hotel. Okay. Would you also like us to provide a buffet lunch? We can do a two-course meal with a number of different options. What sort of price are we looking at for that? Well, I can send you a copy of the standard menu. That's forty-five dollars per person, or you can have the special for twenty-five dollars more. I think the standard should be okay, but yes, send me the menu. Now we're also going to need accommodation on the Saturday night for some of the participants. I'm not sure how many, but probably about twenty-five. So, what do you charge for a room? Well, for conference attendees, we have a twenty-five percent reduction. So we can offer you rooms at a hundred and thirty-five dollars. Normally, a standard room's a hundred and eighty dollars. And does that include breakfast? Sure. And of course, guests can also make use of all the other facilities at the hotel. So we've got a spa where you can get massages and facials and so on. And there's a pool up on the roof for the use of guests. Oh, great! Now, what about transport links? The hotel's downtown, isn't it? Yes, it's about twelve kilometres from the airport. But there's a complimentary shuttle bus for guests. And it's only about ten minutes walk from the central railway station. Okay. Now I don't know Sydney very well. Can you just give me an idea of the location of the hotel? Ah,、uh, well, it's downtown on Wilby Street. Ah,、uh, that's quite a small street, and it's not very far from the sea. And of course, if the conference attendees want to go out on their Saturday evening, there's a huge choice of places to eat. Then, if they want to make a night of it, they can go on to one of the clubs in the area. There are a great many to choose from. Okay. So, if we go ahead with this, can you give me some information about how much we're looking at? Good morning. My name's Lucy Crittenden, and I'm the director of operations for an organisation that arranges volunteering in this part of the country. I'm hoping I can persuade one or two of you to become volunteers yourselves. Let me start by briefly explaining what we mean by volunteering. Volunteers are teenagers and adults who choose to spend some time unpaid helping other people in some way. Most volunteers devote two or three hours to this every week, while a few do much more. The people they help may have physical or behavioural difficulties, for example. Volunteers can do all sorts of things, depending on their own abilities and interests. If they're supporting a family that's struggling, for example, they may be able to give them tips on cooking or recommend how to plan their budget. Or how to shop sensibly on their income. They might even do some painting or wallpapering, perhaps alongside any members of the family who are able to do it, or even do some babysitting so that parents can go out for a while. 
The benefit from volunteering isn't only for the people being helped. Volunteers also gain from it. They're using their skills to cope with somebody's mental or physical ill health, and volunteering may be a valuable element of their CV when they're applying for jobs. Employers usually look favourably on someone who's given up time to help others. Significantly, most volunteers feel that what they're doing gives them a purpose in their lives, and in my opinion, they're lucky in that respect, as many people don't have that feeling. Now, I'd like to tell you what some of our volunteers have said about what they do. To give you an idea of the range of ways in which they can help people, Habib supports an elderly lady who's beginning to show signs of dementia. Once a week, they, along with other elderly people, go to the local community centre where a group of people come in and sing. The songs take the listeners back to their youth, and for a little while, they can forget the difficulties that they face now. Our volunteer Consuela is an amazing woman. She has difficulty walking herself, but she doesn't let that stop her. She helps a couple of people with similar difficulties who had almost stopped walking altogether. By using herself as an example, Consuela encourages them to walk more and more. Min visits a young man who lives alone and can't leave his home on his own. So he hardly ever saw anyone, but together they go out to the cinema or to see friends the young man hadn't been able to visit for a long time. Tanya visits an elderly woman once a week. When the woman found out that Tanya is a professional dressmaker, she got interested. Tanya showed her some soft toys she'd made, and the woman decided to try it herself. And now she really enjoys it and spends hours making toys. They're not perhaps up to Tanya's standard yet, but she gains a lot of pleasure from doing it. Alexi is a volunteer with a family that faces a number of difficulties. By calmly talking over possible solutions with family members, he's helping them to realise that they aren't helpless and that they can do something themselves to improve their situation. This has been great for their self-esteem, and the last volunteer I'll mention, though there are plenty more, is Juba. She volunteers with a teenage girl with learning difficulties who wasn't very good at talking to other people. Juba's worked very patiently with her, and now the girl is far better at expressing herself and at understanding other people. Okay. I hope that's given you an idea of what volunteering is all about. Now I'd like to talk to you about. So, how are you getting on with your teaching practice at the high school, Joe? Well, I've been put in charge of the school marching band, and it's quite a responsibility. I'd like to talk it over with you. Go ahead. You better start by giving me a bit of background. Okay. Well, the band has students in it from all years, so they're aged 11 to 18, and there are about 50 of them altogether. It's quite a popular activity within the school. I've never worked with a band of more than 20 before, and this is very different. I can imagine. They aren't really good enough to enter national band competitions, but they're in a regional one later in the term. Even if they don't win, and I don't expect them to. Hopefully, it'll be an incentive for them to try and improve. Yes, hopefully. Well, now the town council's organizing a carnival in the summer, and the band has been asked to perform. If you ask me, they aren't really up to it yet, and I need to get them functioning better as a band and in a very short time. Have you been doing anything with them apart from practicing the music? I mean, I played a recording I came across. Of a drummer talking about how playing in a band had changed his life, I think it was an after-dinner speech. I thought it was pretty inspiring because being in the band had stopped him from getting involved in crime. The students seemed to find it interesting too. That's good. I'm planning to show them that old film from the 1940s, "Strike Up the Band," and talk about it with the students. What do you think? Good idea. 
As it's about a school band, it might make the students realize how much they can achieve if they work together. That's what I've got in mind. I'm hoping I can take some of the band to a parade that's going to take place next month. A couple of marching bands will be performing, and the atmosphere should be quite exciting. It depends on whether I can persuade the school to hire a coach or two to take us there. Hmm. They sound like good ideas to me. Thanks. Can I tell you about a few people in the band who I'm finding it quite difficult to cope with? I'm sure you'll have some ideas about what I can do. Go ahead. There's a flautist who says she loves playing in the band. We rehearse twice a week after school, but she's hardly ever there. Then she looks for me the next day and gives me a very plausible reason. She says she had to help her mother, or she's been ill. But to be honest, I don't believe her. Oh dear! Any more students with difficulties? Plenty.、Uh, there's a trumpeter who thinks she's the best musician in the band, though she certainly isn't. She's always saying what she thinks other people should do, which makes my job pretty difficult. She sounds a bit of a nightmare. You can say that again.、Uh, one of the trombonists has got an impressive sense of rhythm and could be an excellent musician, except that he has breathing difficulties. And he doesn't really have enough breath for the trombone. He'd be much better off playing percussion, for instance, but he refuses to give up, so he ends up only playing half the notes. I suppose you have to admire his determination. Maybe one of the percussionists isn't too bad, but he never seems to interact with other people, and he always rushes off as soon as the rehearsal ends. I don't know if there are family reasons or what. But it isn't good in a band where people really need to feel they're part of a group. Hmm. There are others too, but at least that gives you an idea of what I'm up against. Do you have any thoughts about what I can do, Lizzie? As you all know, the university is planning an arts festival for later this year, and here in the music department, we've planned three concerts. These will be public performances, and the program has just been finalised. The theme of the festival is links between the UK and Australia, and this is reflected in the music. Each concert will feature both British and Australian composers. I'll tell you briefly about the Australian music, as you probably won't be familiar with that. The first concert will include music by Liza Lim, who was born in Perth, Western Australia, in 1966. As a child, Lim originally learned to play the piano, like so many children, and also the violin. But when she was 11, her teachers encouraged her to start composing. She found this was her real strength, and she studied and later taught composition. Both in Australia and in other countries, as a composer, she has received commissions from numerous orchestras, other performers, and festivals in several countries. Liza Lim's compositions are vibrant and full of energy, and she often explores Asian and Australian Aboriginal cultural sources, including the native instrument, the didgeridoo. This is featured in a work called *The Compass*. Her music is very expressive, so although it is complex, it has the power of connecting with audiences and performers alike. In the festival, we're going to give a semi-staged performance of the Oresteia. This is an opera in seven parts, based on the trilogy of ancient Greek tragedies by Aeschylus. Lim composed this when she was in her mid twenties, and she also wrote the text along with Barry Kosky. It's performed by six singers, a dancer, and an orchestra that, as well as standard orchestral instruments, includes electric guitar and a traditional Turkish stringed instrument. Lim wrote that because the stories in the tragedies are not easy to tell. The sounds she creates are also disturbing, and they include breathing, sobbing, 
laughing, and whistling. The work lasts around seventy-five minutes, and the rest of the concert will consist of orchestral works by the British composers Rafe Vaughan Williams and Frederick Delius. Moving on now to our second concert. This will begin with instrumental music by British composers Benjamin Britten and Judith Weir. After the interval, we'll go to Australia for a piece by Ross Edwards, "The Tower of Remoteness." According to Edwards, the inspiration for this piece came from nature, when he was sitting alone in the dry bed of a creek, overshadowed by the leaves of palm trees. Listening to the birds and insects, the Tower of Remoteness is scored for piano and clarinet. Edward says he realized years after writing the piece that he had subconsciously modeled its opening phrase on a bird call. Ross Edwards was born in 1943 in Sydney, Australia, and studied at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music. And the universities of Adelaide and Sydney. He's well known in Australia, and in fact, he's one of the country's most performed composers. He's written a wide range of music, from symphonies and concertos to some composed specifically for children. Edwards's music has been described as being deeply connected to Australia, and it can be regarded. As a celebration of the diversity of cultures that Australia can be proud of, the last of the three Australian composers to be represented in our festival is Carl Vine. Born in 1954, Vine, like Liza Lim, comes from Perth, Western Australia. He took up the cornet at the age of five, switching to the piano five years later. However, he went to university to study physics before changing to composition. After graduating, he moved to Sydney and worked as a freelance pianist and composer. Before long, he had become prominent in Australia as a composer for dance, and in fact, has written twenty-five scores of that type. In our third concert. Vine will be represented by his music for the flag handover ceremony of the Olympics held in 1996. This seven-minute orchestral piece was, of course, heard by millions of people worldwide, and we'll hear it alongside works written by British composers Edward Elgar and, more recently, Thomas Ades. Good morning. Clare House Hotel, Andrew speaking. I'm the events manager. Good morning, Andrew. My name's Samantha. I'm arranging a party for my parents' fiftieth wedding anniversary, and I'm ringing to ask about hiring a room sometime next September. Also, my parents and several of the guests will need accommodation. Okay, I'm sure we can help you with that. Will you be having a sit-down meal or a buffet? Probably a sit-down. And do you know how many people there'll be? Around eighty, I think. Well, we have two rooms that can hold that number. One is the Adelphi room, that can seat eighty-five, or hold over a hundred if people are standing for a buffet. Right. If you have live music. There's room for four or five musicians in the gallery overlooking the room. Our guests usually appreciate the fact that the music can be loud enough for dancing, but not too loud for conversation. Yes, I really don't like it when you can't talk. Exactly. Now the Adelphi room is at the back of the hotel, and there are French windows leading out onto the terrace. This has a beautiful display of pots of roses at that time of the year. Which direction does it face? Southwest. So that side of the hotel gets the sun in the afternoon and early evening. Very nice. From the terrace, 
You can see the area of trees within the grounds of the hotel, or you can stroll through there to the river. That's on the far side, so it isn't visible from the hotel. Okay. Then another option is the Carlton Room. This is a bit bigger. It can hold up to a hundred and ten people, and it has the advantage of a stage, which is useful if you have any entertainment, or indeed a small band can fit onto it. Hmm. And can you go outside from the room? No, the Carlton Room is on the first floor, but on one side the windows look out onto the lake. Lovely. I think either of those rooms would be suitable. Can I tell you about some of the options we offer in addition? Please do. As well as a meal, you can have an MC, a master of ceremonies, who'll be with you throughout the party. What exactly is the MC's function? I suppose they make a speech during the meal if we need one, do they? That's right. All our MCs are trained as public speakers, so they can easily get people's attention. Many guests are glad to have someone who can make themselves heard above the chatter, and they're also your support. If anything goes wrong, the MC will deal with it, so you can relax. Great. I'll need to ask you about food, but something else that's important is accommodation. You obviously have rooms in the hotel, but do you also have any other accommodation? Like cabins, for example. Yes, there are five in the grounds, all self-contained. They each sleep two to four people and have their own living room, bathroom, and small kitchen. That sounds perfect for what we'll need. Now you have various facilities, don't you? Are they all included in the price of hiring the room? The pool, for instance. Normally, you'd be able to use it, but it'll be closed throughout September for refurbishment. I'm afraid. The gym will be available, though, at no extra charge. That's open all day from six in the morning until midnight. Right. And the tennis courts, but there is a small additional payment for those. We have four courts, and it's worth booking in advance if you possibly can. As there can be quite a long waiting list for them. Right. Now, could we discuss the food? This would be dinner around seven o'clock. And... Hello, everyone. I'm Jake Stevens, and I'm your rep here at the hotel. I'm sure you'll all have a great time here. So, let me tell you a bit about what's on offer. I'll start by telling you about some of the excursions that are available for guests. One thing you have to do while you're here is go dolphin watching. On our boat trips, we pretty well guarantee you'll see dolphins. If you don't, you can repeat the trip free of charge. We organise daily trips for just thirty-five euros. Unfortunately, there aren't any places left for this afternoon's trip, but come and see me to book for later in the week. If you're energetic. I'd recommend our forest walk. It's a guided walk of about seven kilometers. There'll be a stop halfway, and you'll be provided with a drink and sandwiches. There's some fairly steep climbs up the hills, so you need to be reasonably fit for this one, with good shoes, oh, and bring a waterproof in case it rains. It's just twenty-five euros, all inclusive, and it's every Wednesday. Then on Thursdays we organise a cycle trip, which will give you all the fun of biking without the effort. We'll take you and your bike up to the top of Mount Lana, and leave you to bike back. It's a 700 meter drop in just 20 kilometres, so this isn't really for inexperienced cyclists, as you'll be going pretty fast. And if it's a clear day, you'll have fantastic views. On our local craft tour, you can find out about the traditional activities in the island. And the best thing about this trip is that it's completely free. You'll be taken to a factory where jewellery is made, and also a ceramics centre.
If you want, you can buy some of the products, but that's entirely up to you. The trip starts after lunch on Thursday, and you'll return by 6 p.m. If you're interested in astronomy, you may already know that the island's one of the best places in the world to observe the night sky. We can offer trips to the observatory on Friday for those who are interested. They cost 90 euros per person, and you'll be shown the huge telescopes and have a talk from an expert who will explain all about how they work. Afterwards, we'll head down to Sunset Beach, where you can have a dip in the ocean if you want, before we head off back to the hotel. Finally, there's horse riding. This is organised by the Equestrian Centre over near Playa Cortino, and it's a great experience if you're a keen horseback rider, or even if you've never been on a horse before. They take you down to the beach, and you can canter along the sand and through the waves. It costs 35 euros, and it's available every day. So, there's plenty to do in the daytime, but what about nightlife? Well, the number one attraction's called Musical Favourites. Guests enjoy a three-course meal and unlimited free drinks, and watch a fantastic show, starting with Musical set in Paris, and then crossing the Atlantic to Las Vegas, and finally Copacabana. At the end, the cast members come down from the stage, still in their stunning costumes, and you'll have a chance to chat with them. It's hugely popular, so let me know now if you're interested, because it's no good leaving it until the last minute. It's on Friday night. Tickets are just 50 euros each, but for an extra 10 euros, you can have a table right by the stage. If you'd like to go back in time, there's the Castle Feast on Saturday evening. It's held in a 12th century castle, and you eat in the great courtyard, with ladies in long gowns serving your food. You're given a whole chicken each, which you eat in the medieval way, using your hands instead of cutlery. And you're entertained by competitions where the horseback riders attempt to knock one another off their horses. Then you can watch the dancers in the ballroom and join in as well if you want. OK, so now if anyone has... Hello, Trevor. Hello, Stephanie. You said you wanted to talk about the course I'm taking on literature for children. That's right. I'm thinking of doing it next year, but I'd like to find out more about it first. OK, well, as you probably know, it's a one-year course. It's divided into six modules, and you have to take all of them. One of the most interesting ones, for me at least, was about the purpose of children's literature. You mean whether it should just entertain children, or should be educational as well? Right, and whether the teaching should be factual, giving them information about the world, or ethical, teaching them values. Mm. What's fascinating is that the writer isn't necessarily conscious of the message they're conveying. For instance, a story might show a child who has a problem as a result of not doing what an adult has told them to do, implying that children should always obey adults. Oh, I see what you mean. That module made me realise how important stories are. They can have a significant effect on children as they grow up. Actually, it inspired me to have a go at it myself, just for my own interest. I know I can't compete with the really popular stories, like the Harry Potter books, they're very good. And even young kids like my seven-year-old niece love reading them. Hmm. I'm very interested in illustrations in stories. Is that covered in the course? Yes, there's a module on pictures and how they're sometimes central to the story. Hmm, that's good. I remember some frightening ones I saw as a child, and I can still see them vividly in my mind years later. Pictures can be so powerful, just as powerful as words. I've always enjoyed drawing, so that's the field I want to go into when I finish the course. I bet that module will be really helpful. I'm sure it will. We also studied comics in that module, but I'm not convinced of their value, not compared with books. Mm. 
One of the great things about words is that you use your imagination, but with a comic you don't have to. But children are so used to visual input on TV, video games, and so on. There are plenty of kids who wouldn't even try to read a book. So I think comics can serve a really useful purpose. You mean it's better to read a comic than not to read at all?、Mm. Yes, I suppose you're right. I just think it's sad when children don't read books. What about books for girls and books for boys? Does the course go into that? Yes, there's a module on it. For years, lots of stories in English, at least, assumed that boys went out and did adventurous things, and girls stayed at home and played with dolls. I was amazed how many books were targeted at just one sex or the other. Of course, this reflects society as it is when the books are written. That's true. So it sounds as though you think it's a good course. Definitely. Have you been reading lots of children's stories to help you decide whether to take the course? Yeah, I've gone as far back as the late seventeenth century, though I know there were earlier children's stories. So does that mean you've read Perrault's fairy tales, Cinderella, The Sleeping Beauty, and so on? Yes, they must be important because no stories of that type had been written before. These were the first. Then there's the Swiss Family Robinson. I haven't read that. The English name makes it sound as though Robinson is the family surname, but a more accurate translation would be the Swiss Robinsons because it's about a Swiss family who are shipwrecked, like Robinson Crusoe in the novel of a century earlier. Well, I never knew that. Have you read Hoffman's *The Nutcracker and the Mouse King*? Wasn't that the basis for Tchaikovsky's ballet *The Nutcracker*? That's right. It has some quite、uh, bizarre elements. I hope you've read Oscar Wilde's *The Happy Prince*. It's probably my favourite children's story of all time. Ah,、oh, mine too. And it's so surprising because Wilde is best known for his plays, and most of them are very witty. But *The Happy Prince* is really moving. I struggled with Tolkien's *The Lord of the Rings*. Three long books, and I gave up after one. It's extremely popular, though. Yeah, but whereas something like *The Happy Prince* just carried me along with it, *The Lord of the Rings* took more effort than I was prepared to give it. I didn't find that. I love it.、Mm. Another one I've read is *War Horse*. Oh yes, it's about the First World War, isn't it? Hardly what you'd expect for a children's story. Exactly, but it's been very successful. Have you read any? In today's class, I'm going to talk about marine archaeology, the branch of archaeology focusing on human interaction with the sea, lakes, and rivers. It's the study of ships, cargoes, shipping facilities, and other physical remains. I'll give you an example. Then go on to show how this type of research is being transformed by the use of the latest technology. Atlit Yam was a village on the coast of the eastern Mediterranean, which seems to have been thriving until around 7,000 BC. The residents kept cattle, caught fish, and stored grain. They had wells for fresh water. Many of their houses were built around a courtyard, and were constructed of stone. The village contained an impressive monument: seven half-ton stones standing in a semicircle around a spring that might have been used for ceremonial purposes. Atlit Yam may have been destroyed swiftly by a tsunami. Or climate change may have caused glaciers to melt and sea levels to rise, flooding the village gradually. Whatever the cause, it now lies ten meters below the surface of the Mediterranean, buried under sand at the bottom of the sea. It's been described as the largest and best preserved prehistoric settlement ever found on the seabed. For marine archaeologists. Atlit Yam is a treasure trove. Research on the buildings, tools, and the human remains 
has revealed how the bustling village once functioned, and even what diseases some of its residents suffered from. But of course, this is only one small village, one window into a lost world. For a fuller picture, researchers need more sunken settlements, but the hard part is finding them. Underwater research used to require divers to find shipwrecks or artifacts, but in the second half of the 20th century, various types of underwater vehicles were developed. Some controlled from a ship on the surface, and some of them autonomous, which means they don't need to be operated by a person. Autonomous underwater vehicles, or AUVs, are used in the oil industry, for instance, to create maps of the seabed before rigs and pipelines are installed. To navigate, they use sensors. Such as compasses and sonar. Until relatively recently, they were very expensive and so heavy that they had to be launched from a large vessel with a winch. But the latest AUVs are much easier to maneuver. They can be launched from the shore or a small ship, and they're much cheaper. Which makes them more accessible to research teams. They are also very sophisticated. They can communicate with each other, and, for example, work out the most efficient way to survey a site or to find particular objects on the seabed. Field tests show the approach can work. For example, in a trial in 2015. Three AUVs searched for wrecks at Marzimemi off the coast of Sicily. The site is the final resting place of an ancient Roman ship, which sank in the sixth century AD while ferrying prefabricated marble elements for the construction of an early church. The AUVs mapped the area in detail, finding other ships carrying columns of the same material. Creating an internet in the sea for AUVs to communicate is no easy matter. Wi-Fi networks on land use electromagnetic waves, but in water these will only travel a few centimeters. Instead, a more complex mix of technologies is required. For short distances, AUVs can share data using light. While acoustic waves are used to communicate over long distances, but more creative solutions are also being developed, where an AUV working on the seabed offloads data to a second AUV, which then surfaces and beams the data home to the research team using a satellite. There's also a system. That enables AUVs to share information from seabed scans and other data. So, if an AUV surveying the seabed finds an intriguing object, it can share the coordinates of the object, that is, its position, with a nearby AUV that carries superior cameras, and arrange for that AUV to make a closer inspection of the object. Marine archaeologists are excited about the huge potential of these AUVs for their discipline. One site where they're going to be deployed is the Gulf of Barati off the Italian coast. In 1974, a 2,000-year-old Roman vessel was discovered here in 18 meters of water. When it sank, it was carrying medical goods. In wooden or tin receptacles, its cargo gives us insight into the treatments available all those years ago, including tablets that are thought to have been dissolved to form a cleansing liquid for the eyes. Other Roman ships went down nearby, taking their cargoes with them. Some held huge pots made of terracotta. Some were used for transporting cargoes of olive oil, and others held wine. 
In many cases, it's only these containers that remain, while the wooden ships have been buried under silt on the seabed. Another project that's about to be. Hello, William. This is Amber. You said to phone if I wanted to get more information about the job agency you mentioned. Is now a good time? Ah,、uh, hi, Amber. Yes, fine. So the agency I was talking about is called Bankside. They're based in Docklands. I can tell you the address now: four nine seven East Side. Okay, thanks. So, is there anyone in particular I should speak to there? The agent I always deal with is called Becky Jamison. Let me write that down, Becky. Jamison, J A M I E S O N. Do you have her direct line? Yes, it's in my contacts somewhere.、Uh, right here we are, O seven eight double six five one O triple three. I wouldn't call her until the afternoon if I were you. She's always really busy in the morning, trying to fill last-minute vacancies. She's really helpful and friendly, so I'm sure it would be worth getting in touch with her for an informal chat. It's mainly clerical and admin jobs they deal with, isn't it? That's right. I know you're hoping to find a full-time job in the media eventually, but Becky mostly recruits temporary staff for the finance sector, which will look good on your CV. And generally pays better too. Yeah, I'm just a bit worried because I don't have much office experience. I wouldn't worry. They'll probably start you as a receptionist or something like that. So what's important for that kind of job isn't so much having business skills or knowing lots of different computer systems. It's communication that really matters. So you'd be fine there, and you'll pick up office skills really quickly on the job. It's not that complicated. Okay, good. So, how long do people generally need temporary staff for? It would be great if I could get something lasting at least a month. That shouldn't be too difficult, but you're more likely to be offered something for a week at first, which might get extended. It's unusual to be sent somewhere for just a day or two. Right. I've heard the pay isn't too bad. Better than working in a shop or a restaurant. Oh yes, definitely. The hourly rate is about ten pounds, eleven if you're lucky. That's pretty good. I was only expecting to get eight or nine pounds an hour. Do you want me to tell you anything about the registration process? Yes, please. I know you have to have an interview. The interview usually takes about an hour, and you should arrange that about a week in advance. I suppose I should dress smartly if it's for office work. I can probably borrow a suit from Mum. Good idea. It's better to look too smart than too casual. Will I need to bring copies of my exam certificates or anything like that? No, they don't need to see those. I don't think. What about my passport? Oh yes, they will ask to see that. Okay. I wouldn't get stressed about the interview though. It's just a chance for them to build a relationship with you, so they can try and match you to a job which you'll like. So there are questions about personality that they always ask candidates. Fairly basic ones, and they probably won't ask anything too difficult, like what your plans are for the future. <laughs> Hope not. Anyway, there are lots of benefits to using an agency. For example, the interview will be useful because they'll give you feedback on your performance, so you can improve next time. And they'll have access to jobs which aren't advertised. Exactly, most temporary jobs aren't advertised. And I expect finding a temporary job this way takes a lot less time. It's much easier than ringing up individual companies. Yes, indeed. Well, I think I've covered it. Good morning. My name's Erica Matthews, and I'm the owner of Matthews Island Holidays, a company set up by my parents. Thank you for coming to this presentation, in which I hope to interest you in what we have to offer. We're a small family-run company, and we believe in the importance of the personal touch. So we don't aim to compete with other companies on the number of customers. What we do is build on our many years' experience, more than almost any other rail holiday company, 
To ensure we provide perfect holidays in a small number of destinations, which we've got to know extremely well. I'll start with our six day Isle of Man holiday. This is a fascinating island in the Irish Sea, with Wales to the south, England to the east, Scotland to the north, and Northern Ireland to the west. Our holiday starts in Heesham, where your tour manager will meet you. Then you'll travel by ferry to the Isle of Man. Some people prefer to fly from Luton instead, and another popular option is to go by train to Liverpool and take a ferry from there. You have five nights in the hotel, and the price covers five breakfasts and dinners and lunch on the three days when there are organised trips. Day four is free, and most people have lunch in a cafe or restaurant in Douglas. The price of the holiday includes the ferry to the Isle of Man, all travel on the island, the hotel, and the meals I've mentioned. Incidentally, we try to make booking our holidays as simple and fair as possible, so, unlike with many companies, the price is the same whether you book six months in advance or at the last minute, and there's no supplement for single rooms in hotels. If you make a booking then need to change the start date, for example because of illness, you're welcome to change to an alternative date or a different tour for a small administrative fee. OK, so what does the holiday consist of? Well, on day one, you'll arrive in time for a short introduction by your tour manager, followed by dinner in the hotel. The dining room looks out at the river close to where it flows into the harbour, and there's usually plenty of activity going on. On day two, you'll take the coach to the small town of Peel, on the way calling in at the Tinwald exhibition. The Isle of Man isn't part of the United Kingdom, and it has its own parliament called Tinwald. It's claimed that this is the world's oldest parliament that's still functioning, and that it dates back to 979. However, the earliest surviving reference to it is from 1422, so perhaps it isn't quite as old as it claims. <laughs> Day three, we have a trip to the mountain Snaefell. This begins with a leisurely ride along the promenade in Douglas in a horse-drawn tram. Then you board an electric train which takes you to the fishing village of Laxey. From there, it's an eight kilometer ride in the Snaefell Mountain Railway to the top. Lunch will be in the cafe, giving you spectacular views of the island. Day four is free for you to explore using the pass which we'll give you. So you won't have to pay for travel on local transport or for entrance to the island's heritage sites. Or you might just want to take it easy in Douglas and perhaps do a little light shopping. The last full day, day five, is for some people the highlight of the holiday, with a ride on the steam railway from Douglas to Port Erin. After some time to explore, a coach will take you to the headland that overlooks the Calf of Man, a small island just off the coast. From there, you continue to Castletown, which used to be the capital of the Isle of Man and its medieval castle. And on day six, it's back to the ferry, or the airport if you flew to the island, and time to go home. Now, I'd like to tell you a bit more. Ed, how are you getting on with the reading for our presentation next week? Well, OK, Ruth, but there's so much of it. I know. I hadn't realised birth order was such a popular area of research. But the stuff on birth order and personality is mostly unreliable. From what I've been reading, a lot of the claims about how your position in the family determines certain personality traits are just stereotypes, with no robust evidence to support them. OK, but that's an interesting point. We could start by outlining what previous research has shown, there are studies going back over a hundred years. Yeah, so we could just run through some of the typical traits. Like the consensus seems to be that oldest children are generally less well-adjusted because they never get over the arrival of a younger sibling. 
Right, but on a positive note, some studies claim that they were thought to be good at nurturing. Certainly in the past, when people had large families, they would have been expected to look after the younger ones. There isn't such a clear picture for middle children, but one trait that a lot of the studies mention is that they are easier to get on with than older or younger siblings. Hmm, generally eager to please and helpful, although that's certainly not accurate as far as my family goes. My middle brother was a nightmare, always causing fights and envious of whatever I had. As I said, none of this seems to relate to my own experience. I'm the youngest in my family, and I don't recognise myself in any of the studies I've read about. I'm supposed to have been a sociable and confident child who made friends easily, but I was actually terribly shy. Really? That's funny. There have been hundreds of studies on twins, but mostly about nurture versus nature. There was one on personality which said that a twin is likely to be quite shy in social situations because they always have their twin around to depend on for support. My cousins were like that when they were small. They were only interested in each other and found it hard to engage with other kids. They're fine now, though. Only children have had a really bad press. A lot of studies have branded them as loners who think the world revolves around them because they've never had to fight for their parents' attention. That does seem a bit harsh. One category I hadn't considered before was children with much older siblings. A couple of studies mentioned that these children grow up more quickly and are expected to do basic things for themselves, like getting dressed. I can see how that might be true, although I expect they're sometimes the exact opposite, playing the baby role and clamouring for special treatment. What was the problem with most of these studies, do you think? I think it was because, in a lot of cases, data was collected from only one sibling per family who rated him or herself and his or her siblings at the same time. Hmm. Some of the old research into the relationship between birth order and academic achievement has been proved to be accurate, though. Performances in intelligence tests declined slightly from the eldest child to his or her younger siblings. This has been proved in lots of recent studies. Yes, although what many of them didn't take into consideration was family size. The more siblings there are, the likelier the family is to have a low socio-economic status, which can also account for differences between siblings in academic performance. The oldest boy might be given more opportunities than his younger sisters, for example. Exactly. But the main reason for the marginally higher academic performance of oldest children is quite surprising, I think. It's not only that they benefit intellectually from extra attention at a young age, which is what I would have expected. It's that they benefit from being teachers for their younger siblings by verbalising processes. Right. And this gives them status and confidence, which again contributes in a small way to better performance. So would you say sibling rivalry has been a useful thing for you? I think so. My younger brother was incredibly annoying and we fought a lot, but I think this has made me a stronger person. I know how to defend myself. We had some terrible arguments, and I would have died rather than apologise to him. But we had to put up with each other, and most of the time we coexisted amicably enough. Yes, my situation was pretty similar. But I don't think having two older brothers made me any less selfish. I was never prepared to let my brothers use any of my stuff. That's perfectly normal, whereas sometimes... Today, I'm going to talk about the eucalyptus tree. This is a very common tree here in Australia, where it's also sometimes called the gum tree. First, I'm going to talk about why it's important. Then I'm going to describe some problems it faces at present. Right, well, the eucalyptus tree is an important tree for lots of reasons. For example, it gives shelter to creatures like birds and bats. And these and other species also depend on it for food, particularly the nectar from its flowers. So it supports biodiversity. 
It's useful to us humans too because we can kill germs with a disinfectant made from oil extracted from eucalyptus leaves. The eucalyptus grows all over Australia, and the trees can live for up to 400 years. So it's alarming that all across the country numbers of eucalyptus are falling because the trees are dying off prematurely. So, what are the reasons for this? One possible reason is disease. As far back as the 1970s, the trees started getting a disease called Mundula yellows. The tree's leaves would gradually turn yellow, then the tree would die. It wasn't until 2004 that they found the cause of the problem was lime. Or calcium hydroxide, to give it its proper chemical name, which was being used in the construction of roads. The lime was being washed away into the ground and affecting the roots of the eucalyptus trees nearby. What it was doing was preventing the trees from sucking up the iron they needed for healthy growth. When this was injected back into the affected trees. They immediately recovered, but this problem only affected a relatively small number of trees. By 2000, huge numbers of eucalyptus were dying along Australia's east coast of a disease known as Bell Minor-associated dieback. The Bell Minor is a bird, and the disease seems to be common where there are high populations of Bell Miners. Again, it's the leaves of the trees that are affected. What happens is that insects settle on the leaves and eat their way round them, destroying them as they go. And at the same time, they secrete a solution which has sugar in it. The bell miner birds really like this solution, and in order to get as much as possible, they keep away other creatures that might try to get it. So these birds and insects flourish at the expense of other species, and eventually, so much damage is done to the leaves that the tree dies. But experts say that trees can start looking sick before any sign of bell minor associated dieback. So it looks as if the problem might have another explanation. One possibility is that it's to do with the huge bushfires that we have in Australia. A theory proposed over 40 years ago by ecologist William Jackson is that the frequency of bushfires in a particular region affects the type of vegetation that grows there. If there are very frequent bushfires in a region, this encourages grass to grow afterwards, while If the bushfires are rather less frequent, this results in the growth of eucalyptus forests. So why is this? Why do fairly frequent bushfires actually support the growth of eucalyptus? Well, one reason is that the fire stops the growth of other species, which would consume water needed by eucalyptus trees. And there's another reason. If these other quick-growing species of bushes and plants are allowed to proliferate, they harm the eucalyptus in another way by affecting the composition of the soil and removing nutrients from it. So some bushfires are actually essential for the eucalyptus to survive, as long as they are not too frequent. In fact, there's evidence that Australia's indigenous people practiced regular burning of bushland for thousands of years before the arrival of the Europeans. But since Europeans arrived on the continent, the number of bushfires has been strictly controlled. Now, scientists believe that this reduced frequency of bushfires to low levels has led to what's known as dry rainforest. Which seems an odd name, as usually we associate tropical rainforest with wet conditions. And what's special about this type of rainforest? Well, 
Unlike tropical rainforest, which is a rich ecosystem, this type of ecosystem is usually a simple one. It has very thick, dense vegetation, but not much variety of species. The vegetation provides lots of shade, so one species that does find it ideal is the bell miner bird, which builds its nests in the undergrowth there. But again, that's not helpful for the eucalyptus tree. Good morning. You're through to the tourist information office. Tim speaking. How can I help you? Oh, hello. Could you give me some information about next month's festival, please? My family and I will be staying in the town that week. Of course. Well, it starts with a concert on the afternoon of the seventeenth. Oh, I heard about that. The orchestra and singers come from the USA, don't they? They're from Canada. They're very popular over there. They're going to perform a number of well-known pieces that will appeal to children as well as adults. That sounds good. My whole family are interested in music. The next day, the eighteenth, there's a performance by a ballet company called Eustatis. Sorry. The name is spelt E U S T A T I S. They appeared in last year's festival and went down very well. Again, their program is designed for all ages. Good. I expect we'll go to that. I hope there's going to be a play during the festival, a comedy, ideally. You're in luck. On the nineteenth and twentieth, a local amateur group are performing one written by a member of the group. It's called Jemima. That'll be on in the town hall. They've already performed it two or three times. I haven't seen it myself. But the review in the local paper was very good. And is it suitable for children? Yes, in fact, it's aimed more at children than at adults. So both performances are in the afternoon. And what about dance? Will there be any performances? Yes, also on the twentieth, but in the evening. A professional company is putting on a show of modern pieces with electronic music by young composers. Uh huh. The show is about how people communicate or fail to communicate with each other, so it's got the rather strange name, chat. I suppose that's because that's something we do both face to face and online. That's right. Now there are also some workshops and other activities. They'll all take place at least once every day, so everyone who wants to take part will have a chance. Good. We're particularly interested in cookery. You don't happen to have a cookery workshop, do you? We certainly do. It's going to focus on how to make food part of a healthy lifestyle, and it'll show that even sweet things like cakes can contain much less sugar than they usually do. Hmm, that might be worth going to. We're trying to encourage our children to cook. Another workshop is just for children. And that's on creating posters to reflect the history of the town. The aim is to make children aware of how both the town and people's lives have changed over the centuries. The results will be exhibited in the community centre. Then the other workshop is in toy making, and that's for adults only. Oh, why is that? Because it involves carpentry. Participants will be making toys out of wood, so there'll be a lot of sharp chisels and other tools around.、Mm, it makes sense to keep children away from it. Exactly. Now let me tell you about some of the outdoor activities. They'll be supervised wild swimming. Wild swimming? What's that? It just means swimming in natural waters, rather than a swimming pool. Oh, okay. In a lake, for instance. Yes, there's a beautiful one just outside the town, and that'll be the venue for the swimming. There'll be lifeguards on duty, so it's suitable for all ages. And finally, there'll be a walk in some nearby woods every day. The leader is an expert on insects. He'll show some that live in the woods and how important they are for the environment. So. 
There are going to be all sorts of different things to do during the festival. There certainly are. If you'd like to read about how the preparations for the festival are going, the festival organizer is keeping a blog. Just search online for the festival website and you'll find it. Well, thank you very much for all the information. You're welcome. Goodbye. Goodbye. I'm very pleased to welcome this evening's guest speaker, Mark Logan, who's going to tell us about the recent transformation of Minster Park. Over to you, Mark. Thank you. I'm sure you're all familiar with Minster Park. It's been a feature of the city for well over a century and has been the responsibility of the city council for most of that time. What perhaps isn't so well known is the origin of the park. Unlike many public parks that started in private ownership, as the garden of a large house, for instance, Minster was some wasteland, which people living nearby started planting with flowers in 1892. It was unclear who actually owned the land, and this wasn't settled until 20 years later when the council took possession of it. You may have noticed the statue near one of the entrances. It's of Diane Gosforth, who played a key role in the history of the park. Once the council had become the legal owner, it planned to sell the land for housing. Many local people wanted it to remain a place that everyone could go to, to enjoy the fresh air and natural environment. Remember, the park is in a densely populated residential area. Diane Gosforth was one of those people, and she organised petitions and demonstrations, which eventually made the council change its mind about the future of the land. Soon after this, the First World War broke out in 1914, and most of the park was dug up and planted with vegetables which were sold locally. At one stage, the army considered taking it over for troop exercises and got as far as contacting the city council, then decided the park was too small to be of use. There were occasional public meetings during the war in an area that had been retained as grass. After the war, the park was turned back, more or less, to how it had been before 1914 and continued almost unchanged until recently. Plans for transforming it were drawn up at various times, most recently in 2013, though they were revised in 2015 before any work had started. The changes finally got going in 2016 and were finished on schedule last year. OK, let me tell you about some of the changes that have been made and some things that have been retained. If you look at this map, you'll see the familiar outline of the park, with the river forming the northern boundary and a gate in each of the other three walls. The statue of Diane Gosforth has been moved it used to be close to the south gate, but it's now immediately to the north of the lily pond, almost in the centre of the park, which makes it much more visible. There's a new area of wooden sculptures, which are on the riverbank, where the path from the east gate makes a sharp bend. There are two areas that are particularly intended for children. The playground has been enlarged and improved, and that's between the river and the path that leads from the pond to the river. Then there's a new maze, a circular series of paths separated by low hedges. That's near the west gate. You go north from there towards the river and then turn left to reach it. There have been tennis courts in the park for many years and they've been doubled from four to eight. They're still in the southwest corner of the park where there's a right angle bend in the path. 
Something else I'd like to mention is the new fitness area. This is right next to the lily pond on the same side as the west gate. Now, as you're all gardeners, I'm sure you'll like to hear about the plants that have been chosen for the park. OK, Graham, so let's check we both know what we're supposed to be doing. OK. So, for the university's open day, we have to plan a display on British life and literature in the mid-19th century. That's right. But we'll have some people to help us find the materials and set it up, remember? For the moment, we just need to plan it. Good. So, have you gathered who's expected to come and see the display? Is it for the people studying English or students from other departments? I'm not clear about it. Nor me. That was how it used to be, but it didn't attract many people, so this year it's going to be part of an open day to raise the university's profile. It'll be publicised in the city to encourage people to come and find out something of what goes on here. And it's included in the information that's sent to people who are considering applying to study here next year. Presumably, some current students and lecturers will come? I would imagine so. But we've been told to concentrate on the other categories of people. Right. We don't have to cover the whole range of 19th century literature, do we? No, it's entirely up to us. I suggest just using Charles Dickens. That's a good idea. Most people have heard of him and have probably read some of his novels or seen films based on them. Mm. So that's a good lead-in to life in his time. Exactly. And his novels show the awful conditions that most people had to live in, don't they? He wanted to shock people into doing something about it. Did he do any campaigning other than writing? Yes. He campaigned for education and other social reforms and gave talks. But I'm inclined to ignore that and focus on the novels. Yes, I agree. OK, so now shall we think about a topic linked to each novel? Yes, I've printed out a list of Dickens's novels in the order they were published, in the hope you'd agree to focus on him. <laughs> <laughs> You're lucky I did agree. <laughs> Let's have a look. Uh, OK, the first was The Pickwick Papers published in 1836. It was very successful when it came out, wasn't it? And was adapted for the theatre straight away. There's an interesting point, though, that there's a character who keeps falling asleep, and that medical condition was named after the book, Pickwickian Syndrome. Oh. So why don't we use that as the topic and include some quotations from the novel? Right. Next is Oliver Twist. Mm hmm there's a lot in the novel about poverty, but maybe something less obvious. Well, Oliver is taught how to steal, isn't he? We mm. could use that to illustrate the fact that very few children went to school, particularly not poor children, so they learnt in other ways. Mm, good idea. What's next? Maybe Nicholas Nickleby? Actually, he taught in a really cruel school, didn't he? That's right. But there's also the company of touring actors that Nicholas joins. We could do something on theatres and other amusements of the time. We don't want only the bad things, do we? OK. What about Martin Chuzzlewit? He goes to the USA, doesn't he? Yes. And Dickens himself had been there a year before and drew on his experience there in the novel. I wonder, though. The main theme is selfishness. So we could do something on social justice? Mm, no, too general. Let's keep to your idea. I think it would work well. He wrote Bleak House next. That's my favourite of his novels. Yes, mine too. Oh. His satire of the legal system is pretty powerful. That's true. But think about Esther, the heroine. As a child, she lives with someone she doesn't know is her aunt, who treats her very badly. Then she's very happy living with her guardian and he puts her in charge of the household. And at the end she gets married and her guardian gives her and her husband a house, where of course they're very happy. Yes, I like that. What shall we take next? Uh, Little Dorrit? 
old Mr Dorrit has been in a debtor's prison for years. So was Dickens's father, wasn't he? That's right. What about focusing on the part when Mr Dorrit inherits a fortune and he starts pretending he's always been rich? <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> OK. So next we need to think about what materials we want to illustrate each issue. That's going to be quite hard. I'm going to report on a case study of a programme which has been set up to help rural populations in Mozambique, a largely agricultural country in southeast Africa. The programme worked with three communities in Chikwalakwala district near the Limpopo River. This is a dry and arid region with unpredictable rainfall. Because of this, people in the area were unable to support themselves through agriculture and instead they used the forest as a means of providing themselves with an income, mainly by selling charcoal. However, this was not a sustainable way of living in the long term, as they were rapidly using up this resource. To support agriculture in this dry region, the programme focused primarily on making use of existing water resources from the Limpopo River by setting up systems of irrigation which would provide a dependable water supply for crops and animals. The programme worked closely with the district government in order to find the best way of implementing this. The region already had one farmers' association and it was decided to set up two more of these. These associations planned and carried out activities including water management, livestock breeding and agriculture. And it was notable that in general, women formed the majority of the workforce. It was decided that in order to keep the crops safe from animals, both wild and domestic, special areas should be fenced off where the crops could be grown. The community was responsible for creating these fences, but the programme provided the necessary wire for making them. Once the area had been fenced off, it could be cultivated. The land was dug so that vegetables and cereals appropriate to the climate could be grown and the programme provided the necessary seeds for this. The programme also provided pumps, so that water could be brought from the river in pipes to the fields. However, the labour was all provided by local people, and they also provided and put up the posts that supported the fences around the fields. Once the programme had been set up, its development was monitored carefully. The farmers were able to grow enough produce not just for their own needs but also to sell. However, getting the produce to places where it could be marketed was sometimes a problem as the farmers did not have access to transport and this resulted in large amounts of produce, especially vegetables, being spoiled. This problem was discussed with the farmers' associations, and it was decided that in order to prevent food from being spoiled, the farmers needed to learn techniques for its preservation. There was also an additional initiative that had not been originally planned, but which became a central feature of the program. This was when farmers started to dig holes for tanks in the fenced off areas and to fill these with water and use them for breeding fish.
an important source of protein. After a time, another suggestion was made by local people which hadn't been part of the programme's original proposal, but which was also adopted later on. They decided to try setting up colonies of bees, which would provide honey both for their own consumption and to sell. So what lessons can be learned from this programme? First of all, it tells us that in dry, arid regions, if there is access to a reliable source of water, there is great potential for the development of agriculture. In Chikwalakwala, there was a marked improvement in agricultural production, which improved food security and benefited local people by providing them with both food and income. However, it's important to set realistic timelines for each phase of the programme, especially for its design, as mistakes made at this stage may be hard to correct later on. The programme demonstrates that sustainable development is possible in areas where there is... Good morning. Thanks for coming in to see us here at the agency, Joe. I'm one of the agency representatives and my name's Sally Baker. Hi, Sally. I think we spoke on the phone, didn't we? That's right, we did. So, thank you for sending in your CV. We've had quite a careful look at it and I think we have two jobs that might be suitable for you. OK. The first one is in a company based in North London. They're looking for an administrative assistant. OK. What sort of company is it? Uh, they're called Home Solutions and they design and make furniture. Oh, I don't know much about that, but it sounds interesting. Yes, well, as I said, they want someone in their office and looking at your past experience, it does look as if you fit quite a few of the requirements. So on your CV, it appears you've done some data entry? Yes. So that's one skill they want. Then they expect the person they appoint to attend meetings and take notes there. OK. I've done that before, yes. And you need to be able to cope with general admin. Filing and keeping records and so on. But that should be OK. And in my last job, I also had to manage the diary. Excellent. That's something they want here too. I'd suggest you add it to your CV. I don't think you mentioned that, did you? No. So, as far as the requirements go, they want good computer skills, of course, and they particularly mention spreadsheets. That should be fine. And interpersonal skills, which would be something they'd check with your references. I think that should be OK, yes. Hmm. Then they mention that they want someone who is careful and takes care with details. Just looking at your CV, I'd say you're probably all right there. I think so, yes. Do they want any special experience? I think they wanted some experience of teleconferencing. Oh, I've got three years' experience of that. Uh-huh, let's see. Yes, good. In fact, they're only asking for at least one year, so that's great. So is that something that might interest you? It is, yes. The only thing is, you said they were in North London, so it would be quite a long commute for me. OK. So the second position might suit you better as far as the location goes. Uh, that's for a warehouse assistant, and that's in South London. Yes, that would be a lot closer. And you've worked in a warehouse before, haven't you? Yes. So as far as the responsibilities for this position go, they want someone who could manage the stock, obviously, and also deliveries. That should be OK. You've got to keep track of stuff, but I've always been quite good with numbers. Good. That's their first requirement. And they want someone who's computer literate, which we know you are. Sure. Then they mention organisational skills. They want someone who's well organised. Yes, I think I am. And tidy? Yes. They go together, really, don't they? Sure. 
Then the usual stuff. They want someone who can communicate well, both orally and in writing. Okay. And for the last warehouse job I had, one of the things I enjoyed most was being part of a team. I found that was really essential for the job. Excellent. Yes, they do mention that they want someone who's used to that. Yes. Now, when you were working in a warehouse last time, what sorts of items were you dealing with? It was mostly bathroom and kitchen equipment, sinks and stoves and fridges. So you're okay moving heavy things? Sure, I'm quite strong, and I've had the training. Good. Now, as far as experience goes, they mention they want someone with a license, and that you have experience of driving in London, so you can cope with the traffic and so on. Yes, no problem. And you've got experience of warehouse work. And the final thing they mention is customer service. I think looking at your CV, you're okay there. Right. So, what about pay? Can you tell me a bit more about that, please? My guest on the show today is Alice Riches, who started the Street Play Scheme where she lives in Beechwood Road. For those of you that don't already know, street play involves local residents closing off their street for a few hours so that children have a chance to play in the street safely. She started it in her own street, Beechwood Road, and the idea caught on. And there are now street play schemes all over the city. So, when did you actually start the scheme, Alice? Well, I first had the idea when my oldest child was still a toddler. So that's about ooh, six years ago now. But it took at least two years of campaigning before we were actually able to make it happen. So the scheme's been up and running for three years now. We'd love to be able to close our road for longer, for the whole weekend, from Saturday morning until Sunday evening, for example. At the moment, it's just once a week. But when we started, it was only once a month. But we're working on it. So what actually happens when Beechwood Road is closed? We have volunteer wardens, mostly parents, but some elderly residents too, who block off our road at either end. The council have provided special signs, but there's always a volunteer there to explain what's happening to any motorists. Generally, they're fine about it. We've only had to get the police involved once or twice. Now, I should explain that the road isn't completely closed to cars but only residents' cars are allowed. If people really need to get in or out of Beechwood Road, it's not a problem as long as they drive at under 20 kilometres per hour. But most people just decide not to use their cars during this time or they park in another street. The wardens are only there to stop through traffic. So can anyone apply to get involved in street play? Absolutely. We want to include all kids in the city, especially those who live on busy roads. It's here that demand is greatest. Obviously, there isn't such demand in wealthier areas where the children have access to parks or large gardens, or in the suburbs where there are usually more places for children to play outside. I'd recommend that anyone listening who likes the idea should just give it a go. We've been surprised by the positive reaction of residents all over the city. And that's not just parents. There are always a few who complain, but they're a tiny minority. On the whole, everyone is very supportive and say they're very happy to see children out on the street, even if it does get quite noisy. There have been so many benefits of street play for the kids. Parents really like the fact that the kids are getting fresh air instead of sitting staring at a computer screen, even if they're not doing anything particularly energetic. And of course, it's great that kids can play with their friends outside without being supervised by their parents. But for me, the biggest advantage is that kids develop confidence in themselves to be outside without their parents. The other really fantastic thing is that children get to know the adults in the street. It's like having a big extended family. It certainly does have a lot of benefits. I want to move on now and ask you about a related project in King Street. Right. Well, uh, this was an experiment I was involved in 
where local residents decided to try and reduce the traffic along King Street, which is the busiest main road in our area, by persuading people not to use their cars for one day. We thought about making people pay more for parking, but we decided that would be really unpopular. So instead, we just stopped people from parking on King Street, but left the other car parks open. It was surprising how much of a difference all this made. As we'd predicted, air quality was significantly better. But what I hadn't expected was how much quieter it would be, even with the buses still running. Of course, everyone said they felt safer, but we were actually amazed that sales in the shops went up considerably that day. We thought there'd be fewer people out shopping, not more. That's really interesting. So the fact that the street was... Tom, could I ask you for some advice, please? Yes, of course. If you think I can help. What's it about? It's my first media studies assignment, and I'm not sure how to go about it. You must have done it last year. Is that the one comparing the coverage of a particular story in a range of newspapers? That's right. Oh, yes. I really enjoyed writing it. So, what sort of things do I need to compare? Well, there are several things. For example, there's the question of which page of the newspaper the item appears on. You mean because there's a big difference between having it on the front page and the bottom of page 10, for instance? Exactly. And that shows how important the editor thinks the story is. Then there's the size how many column inches the story is given, how many columns it spreads over. And I suppose that includes the headline. It certainly does. It's all part of attracting the reader's attention. What about graphics? Whether there's anything visual in addition to the text? Yes, you need to consider those too, because they can have a big effect on the reader's understanding of the story, sometimes a bigger effect than the text itself. Then you'll need to look at how the item is put together. What structure is it given? Bear in mind that not many people read beyond the first paragraph. So what has the journalist put at the beginning? And if, say, there are conflicting opinions about something, does one appear near the end where people probably won't read it? And newspapers sometimes give wrong or misleading information, don't they? either deliberately or by accident. Should I be looking at that too? Yes, if you can. Compare what's in different versions. And as far as possible, try and work out what's true and what isn't. And that relates to a very important point. What's the writer's purpose? Or at least the most important one, if they have several. It may seem to be to inform the public. But often, it's that they want to create fear or controversy or to make somebody look ridiculous. Gosh, I see what you mean. And I suppose the writer may make assumptions about the reader. That's right. About their knowledge of the subject, their attitudes and their level of education, which means writing so that the readers understand without feeling patronised. All of that will make a difference to how the story is presented. Does it matter what type of story I write about? No. National or international politics, the arts, anything, as long as it's covered in two or three newspapers. Though, of course, it'll be easier and more fun if it's something you're interested in and know something about. And on that basis, a national news item would be worth analysing. I'm quite keen on politics, so I'll try and find a suitable topic. What did you choose for your analysis, Tom? I was interested in how newspapers express their opinions explicitly. So I wanted to compare editorials in different papers. But when I started looking, I couldn't find two on the same topic that I felt like analysing. In that case, I won't even bother to look. <laughs> so in the end... I chose a human interest story, a terribly emotional story about a young girl who was very ill, and lots of other people, mostly strangers, 
raised money so she could go abroad for treatment. Actually, I was surprised. Some papers just wrote about how wonderful everyone was, but others considered the broader picture, like why treatment wasn't available here. Hmm. I usually find stories like that raise quite strong feelings in me. I'll avoid that. <laughs> Perhaps I'll choose an arts topic, like different reviews of a film or something about funding for the arts. I'll think about that. Yes, that might be interesting. Okay, well, thanks a lot for your help, Tom. It's been really useful. You're welcome. Good luck with the assignment, Hazel. Nowadays, we use different products for personal cleanliness, laundry, dishwashing, and household cleaning. But this is very much a 20th century development. The origins of cleanliness date back to prehistoric times. Since water is essential for life, the earliest people lived near water and knew something about its cleansing properties, at least that it rinsed mud off their hands. During the excavation of ancient Babylon, evidence was found that soap-making was known as early as 2800 BC. Archaeologists discovered cylinders made of clay, with inscriptions on them saying that fats were boiled with ashes. This is a method of making soap, though there's no reference to the purpose of this material. The early Greeks bathed for aesthetic reasons and apparently didn't use soap. Instead, they cleaned their bodies with blocks of sand, uh, pumice and ashes, then anointed themselves with oil and scraped off the oil and dirt with a metal instrument known as a strigil. They also used oil mixed with ashes. Clothes were washed without soap in streams. The ancient Germans and Gauls are also credited with discovering how to make a substance called soap made of melted animal fat and ashes. They used this mixture to tint their hair red. Soap got its name, according to an ancient Roman legend, from Mount Sapo, where animals were sacrificed, leaving deposits of animal fat. Rain washed these deposits, along with wood ashes, down into the clay soil along the River Tiber. Women found that this mixture greatly reduced the effort required to wash their clothes. As Roman civilization advanced, so did bathing. The first of the famous Roman baths, supplied with water from their aqueducts, was built around 312 BC. The baths were luxurious, and bathing became very popular. And by the 2nd century AD, the Greek physician Galen recommended soap for both medicinal and cleansing purposes. After the fall of Rome in 467 AD and the resulting decline in bathing habits, much of Europe felt the impact of filth on public health. This lack of personal cleanliness and related unsanitary living conditions were major factors in the outbreaks of disease in the Middle Ages, and especially the Black Death of the 14th century. Nevertheless, Soap-making became an established craft in Europe, and associations of soap-makers guarded their trade secrets closely. Vegetable and animal oils were used with ashes of plants, along with perfume, apparently for the first time. Gradually, more varieties of soap became available for shaving and shampooing, as well as bathing and laundering. A major step toward large-scale commercial soap-making occurred in 1791, when a French chemist, Nicolas Leblanc, patented a process for turning salt into soda ash, or sodium carbonate. Soda ash is the alkali obtained from ashes that combines with fat to form soap. The Leblanc process yielded quantities of good quality, inexpensive soda ash. Modern soap-making was born some 20 years later, in the early 19th century, with the discovery by Michel-Eugène Chevreul, 
another French chemist, of the chemical nature and relationship of fats, glycerine, and fatty acids. His studies established the basis for both fat and soap chemistry, and soap making became a science. Further developments during the 19th century made it easier and cheaper to manufacture soap. Until the 19th century, soap was regarded as a luxury item and was heavily taxed in several countries. As it became more readily available, it became an everyday necessity, a development that was reinforced when the high tax was removed. Soap was then something ordinary people could afford, and cleanliness standards improved. With this widespread use came the development of milder soaps for bathing and soaps for use in the washing machines that were available to consumers by the turn of the 20th century. Hello, do you mind if I ask you some questions about your journey today? We're doing a customer satisfaction survey. Yes, OK. I've got about 10 minutes before my train home leaves. I'm on a day trip. Great, thank you. So, first of all, could you tell me your name? It's Sophie Bird. Thank you. And would you mind telling me what you do? I'm a journalist. Oh, really? That must be interesting. Yes, it is. So, was the reason for your visit here today work? Actually, it's my day off. I came here to do some shopping. Oh, right. But I do sometimes come here for work. OK. Now, I'd like to ask some questions about your journey today, if that's OK. Yes, no problem. Right. So, can you tell me which station you're travelling back to? Stormforth, where I live. Ah, can I just check the spelling? S-T-A-U-N-F-I-R-T-H? That's right. Mm -hmm. And you travelled from there this morning? Yes. OK, good. Next, can I ask what kind of ticket you bought? I assume it wasn't a season ticket as you don't travel every day. That's right. No, I just got a normal return ticket. I don't have a rail card, so I didn't get any discount. I keep meaning to get one because it's a lot cheaper. Yes, you'd have saved 20% on your ticket today. <sighs> so you paid the full price for your ticket? I paid £23.70. OK. Do you think that's good value for money? Not really. I think it's too much for a journey that only takes 45 minutes. Yes, that's one of the main complaints we get. So, you didn't buy your ticket in advance? No. I know it's cheaper if you buy a week in advance, but I didn't know I was coming then. I know. You can't always plan ahead. So, uh, did you buy it this morning? No, it was yesterday. Right. And do you usually buy your tickets at the station? Well, I do usually, but the ticket office closes early and I hate using ticket machines. I think ticket offices should be open for longer hours. There's always a queue for the machines and they're often out of order. Mm, a lot of customers are saying the same thing. So, to answer your question, I got an e-ticket online. E? Thank you. Now, I'd like to ask you about your satisfaction with your journey. So what would you say you were most satisfied with today? Well, I like the Wi-Fi on the train. It's improved a lot. It makes it easier for me to work if I want to. That's the first time today anyone's mentioned that. Oh. It's good to get some positive feedback on that. Mm. And um, is there anything you weren't satisfied with? Well, normally the trains run on time and are pretty reliable, but today there was a delay... The train was about 15 minutes behind schedule. Mm, OK, I'll put that down. Now, I'd also like to ask about the facilities at the station. You've probably noticed that the whole station's been upgraded. What are you most satisfied with? Uh, I think the best thing is that they've improved the amount of information about train times, etc., that's given to passengers. It's much clearer. Before, there was only one board and I couldn't always see it properly, which was frustrating. That's good. And is there anything you're not satisfied with? Let's see. I think things have generally improved a lot. The trains are much more modern and I like the new cafe. But one thing is that there aren't enough places to sit down, especially on the platforms. OK. 
So I'll put seating down, shall I, as the thing you're least satisfied with? Yes, OK. Can I ask your opinion about some of the other facilities? Mm-hmm. We'd like feedback on whether people are satisfied, dissatisfied, or neither satisfied nor dissatisfied. OK. What about the parking at the station? Well, to be honest, I don't really have an opinion, as I never use it. So neither satisfied nor dissatisfied for that, then? Yes, I suppose so. OK, uh, and what about the... As chair of the Town Council Subcommittee on Park Facilities, I'd like to bring you up to date on some of the changes that have been made recently to the Croft Valley Park. So if you could just take a look at the map I handed out, let's begin with a general overview. So, the basic arrangement of the park hasn't changed. It still has two gates, north and south, and a lake in the middle. The cafe continues to serve an assortment of drinks and snacks and is still in the same place, looking out over the lake and next to the old museum. We're hoping to change the location of the toilets and bring them nearer to the centre of the park, as they're a bit out of the way at present, near the adventure playground, in the corner of your map. The formal gardens have been replanted and should be at their best in a month or two. They used to be behind the old museum, but we've now used the space near the south gate, between the park boundary and the path that goes past the lake towards the old museum. We have a new outdoor gym for adults and children, which is already proving very popular. It's by the glass houses, just to the right of the path from the south gate. You have to look for it, as it's a bit hidden in the trees. One very successful introduction has been our skateboard ramp. It's in constant use during the evenings and holidays. It's near the old museum, at the end of a little path that leads off from the main path between the lake and the museum. We've also introduced a new area for wildflowers to attract bees and butterflies. It's on a bend in the path that goes round the east side of the lake, just south of the Adventure Playground. Now, let me tell you a bit more about some of the changes to Croft Valley Park. One of our most exciting developments has been the Adventure Playground. We were aware that we had nowhere for children to let off steam and decided to use our available funds to set up a completely new facility in a large space to the north of the park. It's open year-round, though it closes early in the winter months, and entrance is completely free. Children can choose whatever activities they want to do, irrespective of their age. But we do ask adults not to leave them on their own there. There are plenty of seats where parents can relax and keep an eye on their children at the same time. Lastly, the glass houses. A huge amount of work has been done on them to repair the damage following the disastrous fire that recently destroyed their western side. Over £80,000 was spent on replacing the glass walls and the metal supports as well as the plants that had been destroyed, although, unfortunately, the collection of tropical palm trees has proved too expensive to replace up to now. At present, the glass houses are open from 10am to 3pm Mondays to Thursdays, and it's hoped to extend this to the weekend soon. We're grateful to all those who helped us by contributing their time and money to this achievement. The gardens have really been a... OK, Jack, before we plan our presentation about refrigeration, 
let's discuss what we've discovered so far. Fine, Annie. Though I have to admit, I haven't done much research yet. Nor me. But I found an interesting article about ice houses. I'd seen some 18th and 19th century ones here in the UK, so I knew they were often built in a shady area or underground, close to lakes that might freeze in the winter. Then blocks of ice could be cut and stored in the ice house. I didn't realise that insulating the blocks with straw or sawdust meant they didn't melt for months. The ancient Romans had refrigeration too. I didn't know that. Yes. Pits were dug in the ground and snow was imported from the mountains, even though they were at quite a distance. The snow was stored in the pits. Ice formed at the bottom of it. Both the ice and the snow were then sold. The ice cost more than the snow, and my guess is that only the wealthy members of society could afford it. I wouldn't be surprised. I also came across an article about modern domestic fridges. Several different technologies are used, but they were too complex for me to understand. You have to wonder what happens when people get rid of old ones. You mean because the gases in them are harmful for the environment? Exactly. At least there are now plenty of organisations that will recycle most of the components safely. But of course, some people just dump old fridges in the countryside. It's hard to see how they can be stopped, unfortunately. In the UK, we get rid of three million a year altogether. That sounds a lot, especially because fridges hardly ever break down. That's right. In this country, we keep domestic fridges for 11 years on average, and a lot last for 20 or more. So if you divide the cost by the number of years you can use a fridge, they're not expensive, compared with some household appliances. True. I suppose manufacturers encourage people to spend more by making them different colours and designs. I'm sure when my parents bought their first fridge, they had hardly any choice. Yes, there's been quite a change. Right, let's make a list of topics to cover in our presentation and decide who's going to do more research on them. Then later we can get together and plan the next step. OK. How about starting with how useful refrigeration is and the range of goods that are refrigerated nowadays? Because, of course, it's not just food and drinks. No, I suppose flowers and medicines are refrigerated too. And computers. I could do that, unless you particularly want to. No, that's fine by me. What about the effects of refrigeration on people's health? After all, some of the chemicals used in the 19th century were pretty harmful, but there have been lots of benefits too, like always having access to fresh food. Do you fancy dealing with that? I'm not terribly keen, to be honest. Mm, nor me. My mind just goes blank when I read anything about chemicals. Oh, all right then. I'll do you a favour. But you owe me, Jack. OK. What about the effects on food producers? Like farmers in poorer countries being able to export their produce to developed countries. Something for you, maybe? I don't mind. It should be quite interesting. I think we should also look at how refrigeration has helped whole cities. Like Las Vegas, which couldn't exist without refrigeration because it's in the middle of a desert. Right. I had a quick look at an economics book in the library that's got a chapter about this sort of thing. I could give you the title if you want to do this section. Not particularly, to be honest. I find economics books pretty heavy going as a rule. OK, leave it to me then. Thanks. Then there's transport and the difference that refrigerated trucks have made. I wouldn't mind having a go at that. Don't forget trains too. I read something about milk and butter being transported in refrigerated railroad cars in the USA right back in the 1840s. I hadn't thought of trains. Thanks. Shall we have a separate section on domestic fridges? After all, they're something everyone's familiar with. What about splitting it into two? You could investigate 19th and 20th century fridges, and I'll concentrate on what's available these days, and how manufacturers differentiate their products from those of their competitors. OK, that'd suit me. Hi, everyone. In this session, I'll be presenting my research about the social history of Britain during the Industrial Revolution. I particularly looked at how ordinary lives were affected by changes that happened at that time. This was a time that saw the beginning of a new phenomenon, consumerism. 
where buying and selling goods became a major part of ordinary people's lives. In fact, it was in the 19th century that the quantity and quality of people's possessions was used as an indication of the wealth of the country. Before this, the vast majority of people had very few possessions, but all that was changed by the Industrial Revolution. This was the era from the mid-18th to the late 19th century, when improvements in how goods were made, as well as in technology, triggered massive social changes that transformed life for just about everybody in several key areas. First, let's look at manufacturing. When it comes to manufacturing, we tend to think of the Industrial Revolution in images of steam engines and coal. And it's true that the Industrial Revolution couldn't have taken place at all if it weren't for these new sources of power. They marked an important shift away from the traditional water mills and windmills that had dominated before this. The most advanced industry for much of the 19th century was textiles. This meant that fashionable fabrics and lace and ribbons were made available to everyone. Before the Industrial Revolution, most people made goods to sell in small workshops, often in their own homes. But enormous new machines were now being created that could produce the goods faster and on a larger scale, and these required a lot more space. So large factories were built replacing the workshops and forcing workers to travel to work. In fact, large numbers of people migrated from villages into towns as a result. As well as manufacturing, there were new technologies in transport, contributing to the growth of consumerism. The horse-drawn stagecoaches and carts of the 18th century which carried very few people and goods and travelled slowly along poorly surfaced roads, were gradually replaced by the numerous canals that were constructed. These were particularly important for the transportation of goods. The canals gradually fell out of use, though, as railways were developed, becoming the main way of moving goods and people from one end of the country to the other. And the goods they moved weren't just coal, iron, clothes and so on. Significantly, they included newspapers, which meant that thousands of people were not only more knowledgeable about what was going on in the country, but could also read about what was available in the shops. And that encouraged them to buy more. So faster forms of transport resulted in distribution becoming far more efficient. Goods could now be sold all over the country, instead of just in the local market. The third main area that saw changes that contributed to consumerism was retailing. The number and quality of shops grew rapidly, and in particular, small shops suffered as customers flocked to the growing number of department stores, a form of retailing that was new in the 19th century. The entrepreneurs who opened these found new ways to stock them with goods and to attract customers. For instance, improved lighting inside greatly increased the visibility of the goods for sale. Another development that made goods more visible from outside resulted from the use of plate glass, which made it possible for windows to be much larger than previously. New ways of promoting goods were introduced too, Previously, the focus had been on informing potential customers about the availability of goods. Now, there was an explosion in advertising trying to persuade people to go shopping. Flanders claims that one of the great effects of the Industrial Revolution was that it created choice. All sorts of things that had previously been luxuries, from sugar to cutlery, became conveniences and before long, they turned into necessities. Life without sugar or cutlery was unimaginable. Rather like mobile phones these days. <laughs>